Hey everybody, today Rado talks through episode 40 of the podcast and let me start off by apologizing profusely. I'm so sorry that this is so late, like three weeks late. I think this is a new record for tardiness on my part, but in my defense, life's been crazy, yo. Absolutely crazy, but we're here now, or I'm here at the moment, about to do top 10, or you know, new games of interest. And I think I'll be skipping the top 10 this month because obviously with all this delay, there were a ton of Q's and A's that came in. So I uh, will just spend more time on that. And next month is October, which means it's going to be Essen time. So next month's podcast will also be late, probably coming in the second or third week sometime because I wait as long as possible right up until the very end before I do my Essen preview podcast episode. So, won't be till November until things are back to normal, but hopefully November will be at a regular time in the first week of the month. Uh, see, anything? Oh, before we go on, one other thing. I've already recorded the Q's and A's, as I always do this kind of out of order, depending on Jen's schedule. And, apologies in advance, the gaming-related question and answer section. I'm trying a new recording method here. I think this is going to sound better. I'm not quite sure yet. haven't put it all together. But I uh, made a mistake when recording the gaming questions and answers, and the sound quality definitely dropped a little bit. Because I had a hum, I had to use Audacity's uh, noise reduction thing that just makes the voice sound a little bit more harsh. So, it's still listenable. I've already tested it. I think it's okay. But just apologies if that's slightly lower quality than everything else. But enough of my jibber-jabber. You have waited long enough, and now I'm making you wait even longer. Folks, hold on a sec. We'll be right back with some new, a bunch of new, games O interest. Okie doke, folks. Let's talk about new games and game expansions, starting with Altiplano the Traveler, which is very interesting to me because... Well, the Altiplano versus Orléans decision that players have to make. Oh, they both use the same bag building system. They're both from the same designer. Which one should I get? You could get both. If you like one, you'll like the other. And they're really nice, interesting, unique flavors. But if you have to choose one, up till now, the easy choice has been, well, probably go with Orléans because it's got two really nice expansions, plus a lot of bonus content that's come out over the last few years. But it looks like Altiplano might be catching up. <laughs> um, what does this mean? I, well, so far, there's no new Orléans expansion announced this year, so maybe Altiplano is eventually going to take over. I don't know. Uh, it's probably something we'll be finding out closer to Essen, but let's move on to the next thing, Carcassonne Safari. Now, I have to admit, Jen and I, we love our Carcassonne, the castle, and no other version of Carcassonne has ever really caught our fancy. But every time another one of these very, uh, you know, alternate-themed Carcassones come out, I, I, they always catch my eye, and this one probably more so than most, because, hey, if it's set on an African safari, you know, laying tiles to get all kinds of wonderful savannas and animals and all that kind of stuff, well, I'm really interested in that, because one of the best vacations Jen and I ever took was an African safari a few years ago. We loved it to pieces, so... You know, that subject matter is very, very attractive, probably more so than any of the other ones. The Star Wars one or the the Fijian Isles, I think, was one of them. Uh, so, Carcassonne Safari, yeah, I'm interested. Also interested in Castle Rampage, which is a game where I'm trying to destroy your castle and you are trying to destroy my castle. I will admit, this is not Jen's in my cup of tea and normally I would not give this a second thought except for the fact that it is from Desire Matthias Kramer, who is one of my top 10 favorite designers of all time. Uh, Glenn Moore is still one of my favorite games of all time. And Helvetia, and I mean, the, the, the guy is just absolutely phenomenal. Everything he does, even when he does very bog-standard, seen-it-a-million-times a million times type gameplay, he always does something really cool and interesting and new and different. So... I'm kind of curious. Maybe he's going to do something that really catches our fancy with a, I destroy your castle, you destroy mine. I don't know. I haven't looked into it too much, but just his name alone gets me interested in Castle Rampage. Then we've got 
Chronicles of Crime, welcome to Redview. Now, I've already done a video for Chronicles of Crime, which is a very, very cool, cooperative, investigate the crime, a series of crime style game, you know, it, inspired by you know Sherlock Holmes consulting detective. And the thing that Chronicles of Crime does really interestingly is brings in a smartphone or you know, pad app that allows you to genuinely explore the crime scene and other locations through a 3D VR viewer type thing that is awesome. It brings these things so much more to life and to me is a great example of how the digital and the analog can work together to give you something better than either one would be on their own. So hey, if new cool gameplay in these expansions for it is starting to see the light of day, that's very, very interesting to me. Uh, this is the one, I mean, there's several coming. This is the, uh, the was it, Welcome to Redview is interesting because it's kind of got a Stranger Things, Goonies, 80s, uh, kids ex investigating a mystery Scooby-Doo type thing going on. I really, really like that. That's very appealing and attractive to me. As a child of the 60s and 70s, you know, I kind of grew up on this stuff. On the other hand, though, they have introduced dice to roll and resolve, which I get why. They, they even said that you know, they're doing it because they're trying to give a pen and paper RPG Dungeon and Dragons type feel, which is very appropriate thematically to set it in the 80s and all of that when D&D &D was kind of at its first heyday. But still, I worry, will that be a turnoff for me and Jen? Because you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again, Roll to Resolve, that is board game junk food, basically. Yeah, it seems really cool at the time when you got all the dice and you're rolling them, but it's just empty calories. So... I don't know, I'm kind of on the fence, but I'm definitely interested. And I, and I love the fact that it shows the developers are not just, hey, let's just put out new stuff and retreat our formula, or retreat our formula over and over again. They're willing to do new and interesting things with Chronicles of Crime, Welcome to Redview. Then there is the City of Rome. I know nothing about this except for one thing, and it's all I need to know. It is from the design duo behind Elysium. And Elysium, one of the best Euro card combo chain games to have come out in the last five years. And, uh, oh man, please! I know they've got, the, uh, they've got the expansion design for Elysium. Please give it to us! Guys, I've already... Had somebody talk to you who was ready? Oh, I'm sorry, that's totally off subject matter. But anyway, while they've uh, been, while, you know, while hopefully the slow path towards getting an Elysium expansion is still being worked on, um, the designers, uh, Brett and Matt, or uh, was it Matt Dunsden and Brett? Oh, I need to look. And Brett, Brett Gilbert, Brett Gilbert and Matt Dunsden have gotten together again for City of Rome. I'm excited. If it's even half as good as Elysium. It could be one of the best games of the year. Moving along, we got another expansion. Clank! Gold and Silk. Man, there is so much Clank coming, and it seems now there's a fair amount of original Clank that's still on the way, and you've got, you know, Clank and Space expansions coming. Clank is good, fun, solid deck building. I'm glad to see more, and so, yeah, more the merrier as far as I say. And then you've got Claustrophobia 1643, which is basically the second edition of Claustrophobia, which is interesting. I've still got my first edition of Claustrophobia with all the expansion content that's ever been released, and it's weird that I would keep this game and love on it so much because, hey... What's it strongly feature? Player versus player trying to destroy each other. One player is the controller of the evil monsters. The other player is the brave heroes or the kind of morally questionable heroes delving the dungeon. So that's something generally I don't like. And then it also has role to resolve combat, which is also something we don't like. But we love the game in spite of those things. And uh, I've always thought it was absolutely brilliant how the you know asymmetrical it is. The, the hero player is playing a radically different game than the dungeon master player. It's still very Euro-y in its approach uh, because while there is role to resolve combat, what's much more interesting is the using dice as resources to reprogram your characters and stuff like that. Really cool. Always loved it, always will. And now it's getting a big, lavish second edition. Whole new game, new adventures, um, same core gameplay, although I imagine there will be some tweaks and, and uh, whatnot. So I'm, I'm, I'm keen on it, although I'm a bit worried, I'm a bit bummed, I should say, not worried, because one of the greatest things about the original Claustrophobia is all the minis that came with it were pre-painted. Yeah, they weren't the greatest pre-painting job of all time, but it's so nice to have painted minis. This new one will not have painted minis. 
sad. Oh, well. But otherwise, very, very excited. I think this is going on Kickstarter next month. Uh, claustrophobia 1643. Then you've got Coma Knots. So, this is really interesting to me. Um, I already did a video for Stuffed Fables, which Jen and I wanted to love so much. There was so much goodness in that game as a, as a narrative-driven, big, ed rollicking adventure story game with some cool, smart use of dice um, and all of that. But in the end, the game was just too easy. Even played with the special variants that could increase the difficulty level gen, I just found it way too much of a cakewalk because it's made for families. Well, um, the designer of Stuff Fables is back, I think using a lot of the same formula and systems that he developed for Stuffed Fables. And, uh, you know, Jerry Hawthorne is the designer in question here. But now he's making a game for gamers. And I am super stoked. This is, I, I don't know, maybe it'll be good for families too. I don't really know. But I, I, I love the concepts of his designs. It's just in execution, they've always just been too light, too gateway, too family friendly. I expect, I hope... For more from Comanauts, which is another narrative-driven adventure game where I think it's uh, you know one of those oh we have to shrink down to micro size and go into somebody's body or no it's not that it's that somebody's in a coma and I guess it's more kind of Inception because we can dive into their coma and kind of pull try and pull them out of the coma something like that love that subject matter love Jerry Hawthorne's big picture structural design. Very excited to find out if this is the Jerry Hawthorne game for gamers instead of game for families that Jen and I have been so desperate for. Alrighty, then more expansion goodness, Concordia Venus. Yay, more Concordia. Oh, this is interesting. I think I read somewhere that this works as a standalone game. It's not solely an expansion. I'm not sure. Uh, apparently, one th the big thing that this introduces is team play, which of course is of zero interest to me or Jen because we only ever play two players. But hey, I'm just happy to have more maps. And since I already had to bite the bullet and ha I have two boxes of Concordia because there's so many maps now available on the shelf, I've got room for more. More Concordia with Venus. Then there is Deckscape, the mystery of El Dorado. Ah, Jen, I really love the first two Deckscapes. They're still, uh, they're definitely my favorite escape room in a box type systems. I, I, I love them to pieces. Jen likes them a lot too. I think she still prefers the exit games the most. Um, but more is better. So I'm very excited to unravel the mystery of El Dorado in the next Deckscape game. And then this one, I, I, I hesitated whether I should put it on my list, but I guess I'm interested. Again, I'm hesitant but interested in Defenders of the Realm 2nd Edition. And I'm hesitant because we played Defenders of the Realm 1st Edition. It was one of the early games we played when we got into board games. We loved Pandemic, and we thought, oh my gosh, a fantasy version of Pandemic? That must be amazeballs. And we found it not to be amazeballs. Not that it wasn't perfectly fine, and I can see why so many people love it to tears. But the reality is, it's another example. I mean, I didn't understand. I didn't have the, the board game maturity to be able to identify why we didn't like it, but we just found, why would we play this when we could play Pandemic? Nowadays, I do have a better understanding of why we didn't dig Defenders of the Realm. Way overly long and overly wrought. Way too many rules for what should be a much simpler, more straightforward system. And way, 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 way too much dice rolling. I have no idea if the second edition is going to change any of those core precepts, or if it's just going to be you know a, a new lick of paint and some spit and polish on a game that, again, people love to bits. If so, that's fine. It probably won't be for us, but I am interested to learn more about the Defenders of the Realm 2nd Edition. No, oh, now this is very, very cool. From Corey Kinetska? Oh, I never know how to say your last name, Corey. Uh, you know, one of the head design guys at Fantasy Flight Games. Made one of my favorite games of all time, Space Hulk Death Angel. He is bringing us Discover Lands Unknown. And here's the cool thing about this. Earlier this year, Gen Con, Fantasy Flight Games released the Keyforge series of games, which is a you know a head-to-head -head dueling card game, you know, inspired by Magic the Gathering. I don't know anything about it. I don't care. I don't want to sit down and duel head-to-head -head with cards with Gen. We did that for years with Magic the Gathering. We're burned out on it. We never want to do that kind of stuff again. So Keyforge, we took a pass on, in spite of the fact that I love the core gimmick 
of that system, which is also the core gimmick of Discover Lands Unknown, is that no two copies of this game in the world will be alike. Fantasy Flight has come up with some card printing system that allows them to make randomly generated cards so that everybody has a 100% unique box all to themselves. In Keyforge, that translated to, oh, the deck I just bought, it's it's full of monsters that nobody else in the world has. Now, which is to say, you know, it's full of monsters that are a unique combination of keywords and stuff like that. That's how the system works. It's more of a, again, it's a printing trick that they can do randomly generated printing on demand. That's neat in and of itself. Didn't care about Keyforge. Love that idea. And so that's why I'm so excited about Discover Lands Unknown because this is going to be a big story-driven exploration adventure game. That's more up Jens in my alley. And even if it does feature too much role to resolve, I really want to experience this. Although it's going to be tough to do. I, I did contact FSG and said, hey, I'd really love to cover this. Will it work? And they were like, well, we're not sure because, you know, uh, you know we don't want to do story spoilers, but, but apparently the stories are unique. I'm not really quite sure how it all works out, but I want to find out. I'm super duper stoked for Discover Lands Unknown. I want to discover those lands unknown. But in the meantime, let's move on to another expansion. Dominion Renaissance? Come on! This, I believe, is now the 12th expansion for Dominion. Which means, once again, I'm going to put off my Dominion run-through that I've had to do for six months now. Because, you know, I had enough thumbs on my request list. I said, sure, I'll do it. But when I do it, I'll also do my top 10 Dominion expansions. Because they're done. But it just seems like every few months, another one gets announced. And another one's been announced. Now I can't do a top 10. I'll have to do a top 12 whenever I get around to this thing. But I gotta put it off one more time till we can check out Dominion Renaissance. And until Donald X. Vaccarino stops making more Dominion, please! Oh my gosh. I can't blame him. I mean, it's a cash cow. People love their Dominion, and so do we. So I can't wait to see what comes about. Even if it does mean it throws a monkey in my wrench. Anyway, let's move on to Fine Sand, which is the latest game from Zyner Friedman Freeze. It's another one of his fast forward games, um, or, or, or fast forward fable games. Oh, that man loves his Fs, and uh, which is a, a concept where over the course of many, many sessions, more and more stuff gets drip fed and added into the system. That's what the fable part is. The fast forward part is that you just start playing. You open the box, you read a couple of cards worth of stuff, and you're just away to the races and playing. He's done a few games with these concepts. I haven't played any of them yet. I have to admit, I'm, I'm a year behind. Oh, it's driving me nuts. I'll talk about that more in the Q&A that's coming up. Um, all I can do right now is apologize. But i got to get those covered because another one is coming out. And Fine Sand, which apparently has to do with building sand castles, it looks like. That sounds fun. Uh, I can only assume will benefit from lessons learned on the previous games in this series. And I always love to see an evolution of a, de of a designer's approach. So that's why it's on my list of games of interest. Fine Sand. Then you got Fuji. Now, uh, this year... Right, no, yeah, this year uh, the Spiel des Jahres and Kenner Spiel des Jahres fell in love with, um, you know, Wunderkind came out of nowhere, designer Wolfgang, Wolfgang Warsch. We, I guess he's been around for a while, but man, he had a very good year with Gone Shown Clever and a few other games that, off the top of my head, I cannot remember what they were uh, because he just he just nailed a bunch of nominations and wins and all that. So, Fuji, I believe, is his first big post Spiel des Jahres. You know, uh, super win. It's his first game coming out, and it's a cooperative dice based game set in Fuji. Okay, I'm on board. Let's play it. Let's see it. Uh, because clearly the world has fallen in love with this guy. And while I don't think any of his games have been for me in Gen, I would like one of them to be. So maybe Fuji will be the one. Then we've got uh, uh, Future Opia, Freedom and Freeze, once again with the F's. Here's the thing about this. It, it, it sounds like after uh, you know run over the last few years, you've been doing tons of these little tiny box games, the fast forward, the fable stuff. This looks like it's a bigger game, a deeper game, a meatier game, getting back to his power grid roots type thing. That's great. I'm interested for that reason, but I'm ten times more interested because of the subject matter. I love this subject matter. It is set in a futuristic post scarcity world. You know, which is something that humanity is moving towards. No matter how bad things get, you know, provided we don't completely destroy the planet, we are going to get to that Star Trek future where no one wants for anything. And 
humanity's life is not you know, the uh, a human's worth is not defined by their work and how much they produce for society it's defined by how much they can produce for themselves in terms of personal fulfillment and growth i love that i mean uh, you know that's kind of a metric i try to that's what i judge people by who cares what they do for their living i mean that's not what we should judge them by we should judge them by the content of their character etc etc this is a game that focuses on that i don't know how but i know i'm interested in future future opia then there is ghosts of the moor Kramer and Kiesling, oh yeah, they never disappoint. Even in a case, occasionally, rarely, it turns out not to be a game for me and Jen, but we're always glad we've checked them out. So I've always wanted to see whatever those two guys get together with. And this year, it's Go Ghosts of the Moor. But what's interesting is it's coming from publisher Tasty Minstrel Games, which is a big departure for them. Uh, you know, stepping away from their regular German publishers and and you know branching out. What will TMG bring to the table? How will Seth Jaffe, I'm assuming, as their developer, kind of change and mold and sculpt? I don't know. I'm very excited to find out. So let's play some Ghosts of the Moor. <laughs> and then there is Gingerbread House. Phil Walker Harding and publisher Lookout Games, I believe the last time these two got together, they gave us Baron Park, which is a phenomenal tile laying, you know, Tetris style, polyomino uh, style game. Fantastic. They've gotten together again. It's a game now where players are building gingerbread houses. What does that mean? What's it going to be like? I don't know. I don't care. Phil Walker Harding is on a tear between Baron Park and the more recent gizmos. He can do no wrong. So I expect no wrong and nothing but right from Gingerbread House. Sorry, folks, I'm being a little bit perhaps not as detailed on these as normal, but there's just so much to go through after being offline so long. I just got to move, move, move on to the next one. Honga. Okay, this is on my list because it is... Uh, another designer pedigree thing, Gunter Burkhardt, uh, his last game was Ulm, which made my top 10 of the year. An absolutely fascinating, brilliant action selection system in a really rock-solid Euro. He's back. He's giving us another Euro. I don't know what it is. I don't care. I just saw his name on the box and said, yeah, going to check that out because Ulm was fantastic. And prior to that, so was Sealand. Sealand is also an amazing game. So Gunter is definitely one to watch. So let's all check out Honga, which I think is, looks like, uh, I don't know, just based on the cover art, it, it looks like a Stone Age era, maybe um, humanity coming to work with animals. I'm not quite sure. Don't care. Gunter Burkhardt, going to check out Honga. Next up, another expansion. Although, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is an expansion or if this is a standalone in the same subject matter. What is it? It's K2... Oh, I really should have looked up how to pronounce this. L-H-O-T-S-E, which I'm assuming is some particular peak somewhere in the world that mountain climbers love to climb. I'm going to assume it's a silent L. I'm going to say it's K2 Hots. 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 Hotse. 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 It's the next expansion for K2. And K2 we still own as one of our most... Actually, if I were to do a top 10 race games, it might be at the top of the list. A great, great racing game. Something Jen and I aren't normally that big a fan of, but we love K2. And the interesting thing is, I believe if this expansion is coming, it must mean the long-awaited reprint of the base game is coming as well. Which is such good news for so many people because it's been so hard to get for so long. Hooray! K2 Hatsa. Yeah, I should have looked that up ahead of time. But let's move on. I can definitely pronounce this one. Lovelace and Babbage, which is going to be a real-time game from Scott Alms, Mr. Tiny Epic himself. And again, while not all of his games end up working out for me and Jen, enough of his have been favorites of ours that he gets a pass. I'm always going to check him out. And hey, if he's doing real time, which I think is kind of a new venue for him to dabble in, and the subject matter is, uh, you know, the early, you know, designs and inventions of Ada Lovelace and. Sorry, I don't know who Babbage is. I just know Ada Lovelace, but I, I'm sure Babbage must be a contemporary. Uh, maybe it's dueling inventions in real time. I don't know. Mostly there because of Scott Alms. 
because we love our tiny epic galaxies and our tiny epic defenders. And tiny epic zombies was pretty good too. Um, so give me some tiny epic Lovelace and Babbage. Although minus the tiny epic, I'm sure. So let's check that one out when it gets here. In fact, I believe there it's going on Kickstarter in October and they are sending me a prototype. So we should be finding out more pretty soon. Now this one... It's crazy when it was first announced. Just kind of came out of nowhere, surprised everybody when it was announced at Gen Con, I think. Man, it shows you how far behind I am. This was announced uh, well over a month ago. What am I talking about? Machi Koro Legacy. Whoa. Now, Jen and I did not like Machi Koro at all. Um, I'm not going to go so far as to say it was a bad game, but I think it did have some real fundamental flaws. I mean, I thought its core... Uh, goods harvesting generation driven by dice inspired by Catan was brilliant. Taking maybe one of the coolest elements of Catan, building a whole game around it, really, uh, you know, a, a wonderful incremental design innovation. Love that. Hated the game. Hated it. Um, tried the expansion. Still hated it. Gave up, and then ultimately discovered other games that did it so much better. But. I love the idea of legacy, and I love the idea of maybe the developers of the original Machi Koro have learned and improved on their design based on I don't know the uh, oh the Valeria Card Kingdoms and you know I mean like I said there's there's a there's been several other games that have borrowed this this core concept and they've all done it very well. If some of those lessons are applied to the original Machi Koro, I like the setting of these cute adorable little towns that get built up, and then it adds a legacy system where over time the game changes in permanent ways with stickers. I'm assuming lots of stickers. Got to check it out. Fingers crossed um, that it lives up to its potential because the potential for Machi Koro Legacy is huge. But now let's talk about Magna Storm. And um, here's the deal. This is the latest big box mega production um, from uh, a Furlan Spila. You know, the um, folks behind, oh man, I'm all of a sudden, Terra Mystica and Gaia Project. And, um, oh, what was, well, okay, uh, they are very, I, I forgot, there's a few others, some Uwe games. I'd have to go look. I'm not going to look right now because I'm trying to move forward. But anyway, suffice to say, I know they burst onto the scene and really made a big name for themselves with Terra Mystica. And they've done nothing but success after success. Magnastorm is their latest. Presumably, it's another really big uh, production. I read the, the description of it, and I thought it sounded like it had a very, very cool, new, interesting take on worker placement. And most interestingly, it's a really far-out design for them, all about, uh, what do you call it, terraforming planets and stuff like that. I guess maybe it's not that far off. Hey, maybe it came about from a uh, Gaia project. I don't know. But... Magnastorm, definitely on my list to watch because they produce really solid, big, heavy meteoros, and that's what I'm expecting here. But then let's move on to Passing Through Petra, which is um, from the same designer publisher as Sentient, which, if you watch my run through for that, that was a brilliant little puzzly game. Puzzly Euro, Jen and I absolutely adored it. Uh, just super sweet. And so, based on that and that alone, Passing Through Petra which I assume is, I don't know if it's some kind of archaeology thing looking uh, through Petra or if it's set in the actual Antiquities era. Don't know, don't care. Uh, the pedigree is there for passing through Petra. And then we've got Perseverance, the Castaway Chronicles. Now, talking about pedigree, this is the latest big, ambitious, crazy bonkers game from Mind Clash, who has previously brought us Trakirian, and then brought us Anachrony, and then uh, Cerebra. So every time these guys go insane with um, big ideas, big setting scenarios, this one is basically set on a deserted island where a luxury cruise ship uh, get stranded, and then everybody has to start surviving, you know, think kind of lost, but then they end up stuck on this island for generations, because it's, it's, uh, there's dinosaurs here, and it's la Land of the Lost type stuff, and when the game picks up, um, you know, there's like this whole new society that's trying to be built out of this few thousand people that got stranded there from a, uh, from a cruise ship. 
That's bonkers, and I love it. I cannot wait to see it. And you know uh, they're going to put together a, a big, insane, lavish production with big, heavy, complex gameplay. This is their specialty. And so Perseverance Castaway Chronicles, this is going to be something to look for. It's going to be like nothing else out there, definitely. But now... Let's talk about a very, very exciting development that I've been hinting at for years, and they finally announced it um, back in August. The second edition of Project Elite coming from Cool Mini or Not. Hooray! Hooray! Everybody will finally get a chance to get their hands on one of the best real-time cooperative uh, games out there. I still think I prefer Escape. Curse of the Temple, although a large part of that might be simply because it was, you know, the game that really kind of introduced me and Jen and most everybody to these kind of real-time exciting captures the the frenetic energy of a video game while still staying in analog tactile form. But man, Project Elite might be better. I'm not sure. But it's so gosh darn good, and I'm so happy everybody's going to get a chance to play it. And hey, it'll be an opportunity for Constantinos and the guys from Artifia to revisit it, um, partnered with the publisher who is known for cool, gorgeous minis. So the game will finally get the lavish production it always deserved but never got. I'm so excited about Project Elite 2nd Edition. Less excited, but still very, very interested in Spell Smashers, which is a is, is a game about fantasy combat using Scrabble style word building. And you know, if you if you told me about this a few years ago, I would have said, nah, not interested, because Jen, I've always said, oh, we hate Scrabble; it's just not for us. But then Paperback, we really enjoyed that, and we've enjoyed several other word spelling driven games that you know that mash. Euro style gameplay mechanisms with Scrabble. So, and we love fantasy. So, yeah, bring it on. Spell Smashers. And if all that weren't enough, the art is from one of my absolute favorites. I think fast becoming one of everybody's favorites, the Miko. So, it's, uh, it's a win, win, win. As is probably the Ancient World Second Edition. Actually, I didn't even know this was coming. It just showed up on Kickstarter one day. I think the Kickstarter might be over by now. If so, I'm sorry, I'm late to the party, folks. It's definitely something worth checking out because the Ancient World was a brilliant worker placement game from designer artist Ryan Lockett, set in his Lockett verse. It was gorgeous. I think it's probably his most beautiful game to date. For, for my taste anyway, and the gameplay was really sharp and smart, but it was just a little bit too cutthroat in the worker placement for Jen's and my taste, so we didn't keep it for that reason. But my understanding is the second edition has made it a little bit more friendly, a little bit more live and let live. I am very, very interested, and I look forward to seeing the final product for the Ancient World second edition. And hopefully it will be able to live on my shelf next to my, my aisle bound and my above and below and my near and far, where it belongs. But let's move on then to 100 Tori, who is, which is designed by uh, Scott Caputo, who uh, did Whistle Stop last year. And earlier this year, I did a run through for his Kickstarter game, Sorcerer City. And gosh, quite a while ago, I did a run through for Veluspa. So time after time, Scott, all of these games show he really understands the art of good game design when it comes to tile laying games. And so he's bringing us another tile laying game, and the art is from Vincent Dutrait. Oh, yeah! All right, must, must check this one out. I know it's going to be a good tile layer. I know it's probably going to be one of the most beautiful tile laying games of all time. Uh, it's uh, putting a little bit of pressure on Vincent, but I am confident in Vincent's abilities when it comes to the 100 Tory. Then we've got The River. Now, this is Days of Wonders' big yearly game. Every year, they put together one beautifully designed, beautifully crafted game. And again, while they don't always work out for us, when they do, oh my gosh, they are some of the best things ever. And um, I'm a extra excited for this one because it's from the designer of Jaipur, which is widely regarded, rightly so, as maybe the best couples game on the market. Although I think um, Lost Cities might vie for that title. Anyway, he's a brilliant designer. He's put out several other really wonderful designs as well. And Days of Wonder always over delivers. So bring on the river, I say. Then we've got uh, Trollfjord, alrighty, which um, is brought to us by the same designers who brought us Avenue. 
Jen, I love Avenue to Bits, although I guess now it's not Avenue anymore. It's what? It's uh, Kokoro Avenue of the Kodamas, I think? We never actually got a copy of that sent to us, unfortunately, so I can't really do an update on it. But um, still, we love our Avenue. And uh, so, they're working on Trollford, which is an area control game. Which, I don't know, we could take or leave, but I'm really intrigued by this dexterity element. There is, as I understand it, uh, a tower full of cubes. Jen loves cube towers. Uh, you maybe saw the recent rundown I did for Stygian Society. And the cubes that are stuck in there come out by us literally taking a hammer and knocking on this tower, this big tree, trying to knock out what we want. That just sounds fun. In a, in a, in a, in a, it, the, the, sounds like the toy factor is going to be off the chart with this. And considering how smart the design for Avenue was, I'm very, very interested in Trollfjord. Then there is Tybor the Builder uh, in Alftrag des Königs. Uh, des Königs, I think. I think that's what an umlauted O sounds like. Hey, it's more Tybor the Builder. Okay, I'm there, because you know how I've been raving about Alexander Pfister, and he's doing these really interesting things with these tiny little card games where he's doing like ongoing narrative that you know that drives the overall expansion structure. I love all that. But then I'm reading and wait a minute. Oh, this one's not designed by Alexander Pfister. He's giving it to somebody else. And oh, it's not gonna be driven by story stuff, huh? What the? That's what I was absolutely loving. But that aside, Tybor the Builder is still a brilliant, sweet little card game. So, an expansion for it? I'm definitely down. I just, uh, I don't know. Although, apparently, the uh, the expansion is from, oh, is it Dennis Rappel, who I guess was the co-designer of the original Tybor. I, and, um, yeah, I, I'm sure it's going to be great. I, I, I don't mean to disparage. I, I realize now, in the process of saying that, it sounds like, oh, it's going to be crap because Alexander's not on it. No, that's not the case at all. I'm, exci I'm excited about it. Uh, I, boy, I, I just totally flubbed that. I should go back and record, but there's no time. I must move forward. So let's move forward from Tybor uh, to Unlock Expedition Challenger. More Unlock games coming. Yes, I know I said I prefer Duckscape and Jen prefers X, but we love the Unlock games. Man, I, I think I've lost track. There are so many of them. There's this uh, Expedition Challenger. Challenger, which I guess has something to do with being, again, in a Land of the Lost style place where dinosaurs still roam and we got to escape. But there's also a spooky mansion one and a, an, uh, you know, uh, Tales of Arabian Nights one coming. So cool. I mean, I love these things. They're just so great. They're a great way to spend. Jen and I find not an hour, but usually a couple of hours because we tr we've learned to take it easy on ourselves and not sweat the timer so we can enjoy ourselves more. So we look forward to unlocking more in Expedition Challenger and the other ones. Then we've got... See, I told you this was a long list, folks. I told you. It's insane. Uh, but not to be too surprising, because, of course, Essen's coming up. And uh, anyway, let's talk about Valpara, Valparaiso. Val, Val, V-A-L-P-A-R-A-I-S-O. Valparaiso. Valpa, Valparaiso. Ah, all right. Anyway, I spelled it. Um, so, it's a, uh, it's a Euro-style game. You know, standard Euro tropes, I'm sure. What I'm interested in is it's from the Maltzes, who I think are brothers. Maybe they're father and son. It's a, a design duo. Their, their, their names are Maltz. And their, the, the last game of note, or, you know, their, their other game of note, Edo, was a brilliant game because of this core central action selection through programming mechanism that was just. Absolutely brilliant. Super duper smart. Well, they're giving us another Euro style game where it's all driven by programming your actions and then watching them play out and hoping it all goes to plan. Loved it in Edo, although the core game of Edo, which was basically pick up and deliver, it was a real shame. As much as we love the programming, it was running a uh, a game that was less exciting, but we love the programming so much. I'm hoping the programming is still good, but now it's a more interesting game structure as well with Valparaiso. Okay, next up, I shouldn't have put this on the list, but I did anyway. It's Vampire the Masquerade Heritage. I did actually play Vampire the Masquerade back in the day, back in the CCG heyday where there was a new one coming out every month for every subject under the sun. Heck, I played the Xena Warrior Princess one, folks. I played them all, the Tomb Raider one, all of them. And I, we played Vampire the Masquerade, and it was fine. I, as I recall, the thing about it was it really pushed kind of a social game. Uh, in fact, would you even play it as a two? I think you had to play it as a three-player. It's been so long. But still, not our cup of tea. And I don't know much about this, I'm worried it's going to be of zero interest to me. The reason I'm interested is because 
it's another legacy style game, a legacy style, um, you know, card game. Uh, and, uh, you know, with apparently potential for co-op. I don't know if that's something that gets unlocked as part of the legacy. I'm really not sure. I just don't know much about this. If It could be this is a real turnoff because, hey, it's just more card dueling wizards or vampires, in this case, going at each other and we put some stickers on. Maybe it will be perfectly fine but not for us. Or maybe it'll be something really, really cool. Hey, it's it's a list. It's a games of interest. And if you if you if you set out to make a legacy game, I'm interested. Just fingers crossed. It turns out to be our kind of game. Then we've got Hokkaido, which is on here because Jen loves Honshu so much. And this is basically the sequel. I don't know what it's changing. I, I think it's still kind of the core, kind of a trick taking slash auction slash you know tile laying city thing all mashed up into one, but doing some extra stuff. I'm really not sure what it's all about, but again, Jen loves Honshu so much, so much we got to check it out. And another one I'd be curious about checking out, in spite of the fact that I, I'm not that crazy about the subject matter, is Claim Kingdoms. Claim came out last year, and it was very, very well received as a fun little trick-taking game uh, that you know kind of thumbs its nose at a lot of trick-taking traditions and had awesome, gorgeous art from the Miko. Hey, it's a sequel now, and um, the Miko is back, and Scott Alms is on it, and maybe it'll be really cool. It's set in the same universe. I don't know if it's a trick-taking game or not at all. Uh, um, if it's something completely different, we I have to admit we never tried claim. I heard nothing but good things. I just assumed it wouldn't be good for because it was for two players. And plus, I saw the, I, I read enough about it. I read the rules. I was pretty sure it wasn't going to be for us. I don't know if this one will be for us either. But man, it's going to have gorgeous gobsmacking art. So yeah, okay. I'm shallow. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Uh, have great art. I'm there for claim kingdoms. Then we've got Dicium. This is interesting. Uh, because it's four games in one box, uh, a uh, a forex style, uh, you know, civilization game and a race game and a euro goods conversion game and I forget oh like a a combat conflict game. Don't care about that last one, but. All four of these games are driven by these cool these Dicium, these cool looking, really nice looking custom dice that are are used in very different ways in each of these four games that come in the box. I love that. That sounds like a crazy ambitious thing that could be a utter and epic failure disaster. Four really crappy, or four so-so average games instead of one really good game. I'm sure a lot of people would argue against that, but I applaud ambition along these lines, so I am definitely interested in checking out Dicium. And then there is Outlaws in a Strange Land, um, which is interesting because I guess it's a... I think it's a post-apocalypse RPG, I think, which is maybe a turnoff for Jen right away, but it is an RPG, you know, where you create characters and you go through stories and it's it's a, a, as much about your imagination as it is about the paper in front of you. Jen, I've always wanted to try that, but it's just the two of us and two player pen and paper RPGs really, I, I've heard good things, but I've just never been convinced to give it a try. I'm interested in trying Outlaws in a Strange Land because apparently it's an app-driven cooperative RPG. And maybe that's the secret sauce. If there is a dungeon master in the form of an app that lets us play through a cool, evocative adventure together, oh, well, I'm interested. So let's check it out when it comes about Outlaws in a Strange Land. Then, okay, now here's one I'm not worried about. I'm totally 100% uber, super duper confident in um, you know, must have awesome gameplay of Pandemic: The Fall of Rome. This is the was it the the third? There was the Cthulhu one and the Dyke one, and yeah, this is the fourth time that Matt Leacock has teamed up with another board game designer who tends to work in different styles, different genres, different milieus. Uh, this time, he's teamed up with Paolo Mori, who is the designer of Vasco da Gama, which is one of the best dry um, cube pushing euros ever. Absolutely phenomenal game. Jen, I love it to bits. Or actually, Jen loves it to bits. I like it a lot, but oh man, Jen loves it. So, Matt working with Palo for a new version of Pandemic, which, well, follows the fall of Rome. I assume instead of disease, it's probably all the outside invaders trying to pick apart the Roman uh, Empire. I don't know. This is going to be awesome. I just know it. I, you know, in my bones, I know it. Cannot wait for Pandemic, fall of Rome. Then you've got... 
I have no idea how to pronounce this. I'm going to say Rolnici, R-O-L-N-I-C-Y, or Rolnici, perhaps? It's from Jeffrey Allers. Haven't seen him for a while, but he's a phenomenal designer. Um, Aaliyah Iokta Est and, um, oh, New Amsterdam and Citrus. Oh my gosh, he is such a criminally overlooked designer. Um, oh, what, well, more recently, uh, oh, 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 Favor of the Pharaoh. And man, I mean, I, I don't know if Jeffrey Allers has ever done a bad design. I mean, they're all really, really good. And uh, as I understand it, I think. Or I could be wrong. Let's see. Didn't I read this somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is... Yeah, somebody posted in a reply. This is why it's so good and useful, folks, to subscribe to my uh, Games of Interest Geek List because often the developers or other... Or the developer... You know, the designers or you know fans of the game, they post and they give more information. Somebody said, this is a card version of... Heartland. And now Heartland was one of his earlier designs, which apparently is brilliant. I mean, Tom Vassell raves about it a lot. I never sought it out, though, because apparently it's also super-duper cutthroat. So having actually said that out loud just now, because I guess I knew it. I just didn't put it all together. Okay, now I'm worried. Is it still going to be super-duper cutthroat? Jeffrey Allers hasn't done a super-duper cutthroat game for years. He does just really interesting, brilliantly conceived competitive games. You know, like Citrus and New Hampshire and all that. So, okay, it's, it's on my list of must-tries. Roll Nietzsche. <laughs> I'll stop right there uh, and move on to the 10th anniversary of Stone Age. Stone Age is great. Um, with, with style as the goal, that really turned it from just a straight-up gateway that Jen and I didn't have that much interest into. A much more long-term game for us that we'd be happy to play any time now. I, don't, I, I know the 10th anniversary is going to be a big deluxe reprint. And, and most interestingly, it's going to come with two sides, the original board, and the other side is going to be like a winter board. And that's going to change up gameplay and introduce some new mini expansions. So yeah, Stone Age deserves it. It's, it. It is deserving of its place in the pantheon of modern board game design. And so I'm definitely interested in checking out and celebrating its 10th anniversary. Then, is this the last one? Yes, it is. And uh, man, folks, whoa, I, I, you know, I, as soon as I knew this, I had to get the podcast done as soon as possible because there's only a few days left. At this point, maybe like four or five days left before this is no longer on Kickstarter. And then I've heard it's probably going to be kind of hard to get to unless you uh, pay international shipping or pick it up at a convention. Merlin, the Arthur expansion. Jen and I really enjoyed last year's Stefan Feld game from Queen Games, Merlin. Brilliant, um, uh, what do you call it, roll and move game on a rondelle. A lot of people didn't seem to grok it, but I just every time somebody says, oh, it's all random, there's no control, that's ridiculous. The game is so smart and so brilliant, so much control. And this seems like a really big expansion with a lot of stuff. Whole new tables, you know, new sides, I mean, just tons of really cool things. I backed it, and... If you like Merlin, you may not have heard because they just did this as kind of a silent release. Didn't make a big deal about it. Wasn't even an added to Board Game Geek's database, um, which is how I would have found out about it. And so I didn't know about it till somebody uh, told me. What was his name? Uh, Alejandro. Again, Alejandro. Thanks for letting me know. I would have hated to have missed this. And if you like Stefan Feld as much as I do, and if you liked Merlin... You might want to go check it out. It's on Kickstarter just for a few more days, folks. And that's it. We have made it to the end of the new games of interest. We're 45 minutes into this podcast, which again is why, as I said right up front, we're going to skip the uh, top 10 revisit. Come back to that in November. Honestly, I don't remember what my last top 10 was. Plus, I'm going to do another top 10, so we'll have more to revisit. Again, Worry about that in the future, because now, if you hold on, we're going to get to the Q&A. And again, apologies in case the audio has a slight drop in quality. Um, should be a one-time mistake, and, and now I'm just talking myself in circles. So, folks, hold on. We'll be right back. Okay, okay. Okay, everybody, welcome back. It is time at long last, very, very long last, for the questions and the answers. Again, apologies for being so incredibly late this month, but hopefully it will have been worth the wait. Honey Pie, will you make it worth the wait? I will do my very, very best. Okay, we are definitely going to do our best as we go through probably, I, I would bet, a longer list of cues than we normally do because it's been uh, such a backlog. But let's just get right into it. Of course, before we get into it, first of all, these will be game-related questions for 
the entire audience, and after we're done with that, for people who don't care about me and Jen as people, but only as game-playing machines, <laughs> if you want to get off, we'll let you know before we get into the personal questions and answers, which is how we'll end as always. But anyway, let's start out with Graham, who uh, wants to talk about pointy fingers. Hmm? Uh, he was watching through some old videos and noticed that when I'm pointing to things, I often do so with my middle finger rather than my pointy finger, which I believe is my index finger. Yes. All right. Uh, he's curious as to whether this is something I do consciously or it's just what I naturally do and also whether anyone has ever mentioned it. Graham, you are the first. Wow. I don't believe anybody's pointed that out. Honey, are you aware that apparently I point with my middle finger at things? No. Maybe that was something um, you did years and years ago. I don't know. I mean, I mean, obviously, I, I would imagine I do it if I have something in my hand. I think I tend to point with both my, my uh, pointer, my index, and my middle finger. I don't know, Graham. I believe you. <laughs> uh, it's probably something I'm not aware of. I, I, I can guarantee you, Graham, it is not me surreptitiously flipping you off throughout all my, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly not that. But that's weird. I guess it's just a quirk of being me. All righty. Michael has a question about Agricola versus Caverna. Always wanted to hear her opinions about both of them. I know you prefer Caverna. or You both prefer Caverna. Michael, I think... You've written into the wrong podcast. Uh, can you comment on the Dice Tower and others who say Agricola forces you to do everything against special uh, instead of specializing? Anyway, I know you both prefer Caverna. Okay, he must have made a typo. He knows we prefer Agricola uh, over Caverna. But he wants to hear uh, the counter-argument. Yes, the Dice Tower and anybody else who says that Agricola forces you to specialize, I guarantee you, Jen and I will kick their butts. They clearly don't understand how to properly play Agricola. <laughs> they are falling into a very um, common trap of making you think like, oh, well, because there's these negative points that I'll get if I don't have at least one sheep or at least one cow or something like that, I must have one of every single thing or two of every single thing. That's not the right way to look at it. Basically, it's uh, you, you have to picture Agricola where, I forget, I looked it up at one point, you start out at negative 50 points effectively, because you have nothing built and you have no livestock, no crops or anything like that. Everybody... Oh, family members. Uh, yeah, or just ma and pa, um, <laughs> you know, and, and not, no stone house, etc., etc. So everybody starts out in a hole. It's not that, oh no, at the end of the game, I'm going to lose points if I don't have a carrot. You started without those points, and you don't need to get those carrot points to win the game. What you need to do to be successful is pay attention to your cards. Um, if you're playing well, and if you use any of the suggested drafts, Jen and I prefer the draw 10 of each and then discard down to 7, but you know, regular drafts, there's several different ways that are listed in the rules. If you play with any of those, you will start with a hand of cards that gives you an overall synergy and strategy to pursue that will all but guaranteed make you ignore cattle or carrots or stone houses you'll want to you know cap out at um clay or something like that and that's the key to victory that i have actually won the game i have scored in the 50s and 60s pretty handily you know not having a full complete family or not bothering with any animals at all only doing crops because i leveraged my cards Getting one of everything and just trying to do a little bit of everything is going to kind of create like a baseline score that's going to do okay, but it's not going to be a truly winning score. You're not going to be getting up um, you know, in the high 50s, low 60s if that's the way you approach the game. Plus... And Jen would like to add something, <clears throat> yes. Plus, I mean, if you just had to play Agricola the same way all the time because you're generalizing, I don't know that it would be that much fun to play after, say, the sixth or seventh time. Um, so actually using the cards and leveraging the cards the way he's talking about gives you a completely different experience every time you play because the likelihood that you're ever going to get the same draw of cards is yeah. very, very slim. Yeah, I mean, that's it's what and, makes us love the game so yeah, much. Yeah, I mean, that is the satisfying nature of Agricola is when you get your cards and your engine is built and it's working and you are like, yeah! Yep. Yeah! <clears throat> so that would be my answer if the question ever came up when I was involved in a QA and a with Tom Vassell, who I know strongly believes the false impression that, oh, you can't succeed at Agricola unless you do a little bit of everything. Specialization is a big, big part of Agricola if you're playing your cards right. All righty. Uh, moving on to Jack, who's wondering, what's the deal with slicker drips? 
Is he a brother from another mother? Um, I don't think you've ever seen his channel, honey, but uh, Slicker Drips, his name is Tom Heath. Actually, uh, you are committed to him. You know, in the same way I always play against you virtually, yeah. he plays against Marty, which is a little cat, a glass cat that you made for him. <gasps> Marty! Yes. Do you, do you remember Marty? It's a little orange tabby cat, yeah. I think. Um, I don't remember Marty particularly, but I do love to make glass kitties. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, Tom, I mean, there, there's no two mistakes about it. I mean, uh, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and I'm certainly flattered. He very much, um, I'm you flattered, know, too, that he plays with a kitty. <laughs> he plays with Jen's kitty, yeah. Uh, so Jen's pulled in as well. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's very much, you know, imitating my style, but that's cool. I, he actually contacted me when he got started out and said, Hey, Rado, we really like your show. Do you mind if I imitate your style? And I said, No, that's fine. I mean... I don't own it. It's not like I patented it or copyrighted it. I, I think it's great that you know there's another person out there because hey, I don't cover everything, and sometimes he covers stuff I don't cover. Uh, I'm happy to. I mean, I'm a subscriber of his in on the off chance because occasionally he gets to a game sooner than me or whatever. So no, no, no. It's uh, it's totally fine. He uh, you know, and you you mention Jack the the fact that he also does Klingon subtitles like me. Again, he contacted me and said, hey, I really like your Klingon subtitles when YouTube did the stupid. Just the as latest in a series of stupid things that makes life more difficult. And they took away annotations. He said, I like your Klingons. Do you mind if I do it too? And I said, no, everybody should do it. And I am happy to see that it is kind of catching on more and more. I mean, it shouldn't be that way. We should just be able to make an annotation track. But say la vie. Um, it almost seems like he's been trained or blessed to slowly take over your place in the board game media realm. Oh. Uh, you heard, you've heard me praise his channel before, but I wonder if there's any connection between you. We know each other. We've chatted a few times at conventions about the behind the scenes and whatnot. He seems like a very nice young man. If I recall correctly, I think he works at a record store full time. Um, and he still does Slicker Drips part time. And his uh, girlfriend is a teacher. Uh, grade school teacher? Yeah, they're very nice. Uh, I had a nice time talking to the UK Games Expo a few months ago. And yeah, he has my full and complete blessing to uh, you know mimic me in any way he wants because, hey, I like my format. So he's the only person <laughs> out there actually making videos for me uh, when it boils right down to it. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Let's see here. Moving on. Daniel has several questions. I completely agree that Pandemic Legacy, Dragonfire, etc. are expansions. They should not be considered base games. Do you think they should have separate entries in BGG um, for the, from their base games? What about 2nd Edition Deluxes, uh, Caverna, Through the Age of 2nd Edition? Uh, I don't really have strong feelings about it. I just know the way I label things. I mean, it's 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 a fair counter argument to be made that no, of course, because they're standalone games, they have to be labeled as games. I'm not bothered by that at all. The only thing I am truly bothered by about that is that the top 100 board games of all time on Board Game Geek has through the ages listed twice for the two different, and that I oh that drives me nuts. That's where I would really like to see the system coalesce. Um, you know, or I think I think Dominion is in the top 100 twice. Once for base Dominion and then once for Intrigue, I think. Is that right? Because, uh, yeah, Intrigue was a, was a standalone. And that's just dumb. That just makes no sense. That means it's really the top 98 because two games was it twice. And it's not just those two. Uh, you know, there's other games beside. And that's the only thing that bugs me is for the purposes of rating and ranking. It kind of messes things up. Otherwise, I'm more than happy. I mean, heck, I think there, I wouldn't be surprised if there's two Puerto Ricos in the top 100 as well. Just ridiculous. Um, do I have any updated thoughts about Spirit Island? I have gotten a retail copy, Daniel. We have not played it. It came like a week or so, maybe two weeks before we left Malta. And I would have loved to play it at that time, but our life has been a constant, nonstop roller coaster of turmoil. And so <laughs> we have carried it. I think it might have been one of the games I actually carried to England instead of putting in the box for the slow shipping overseas. Because I thought, oh, maybe we'll get a chance those couple of months while we're in England, we'll play it. And we didn't. And it's uh, it's on the shelf here. And yeah, I'm pointing right at it. It's right behind Jen's <laughs> head. And no, we haven't played it. I really want to. He wasn't pointing with his middle finger, though. No, uh, no, I was not. Was I? I might have been. No, you used your thumb. Okay, I used my thumb. All I'm, right. I'm watching him now, you guys. <laughs> Keep an eye. So no, we're very much excited. I do have a retail copy. I would love to give it a go and and see if it cracks my top ten of last year. I'm I. You will note. I did not do a top 10 update in April, in large part because I have not had a chance to play Spirit Island yet. Um, so I'm running late on everything. <clears throat> 
Let's see. Next up, related to the previous question, do you believe heavy co-ops um, will come out more fr on a more fr frequent basis? Um, do you like your co-ops to be heavier on the lighter side? Spirit Island 2017 and Mage Knight 2012, very few heavy co-ops. Do you believe co-ops will come out on a more frequent basis that are heavy? I don't know. I don't know. Um... I don't know that there's that much market for really heavy co-ops. I think, by and large, the lion's share of gamers who are looking for a really, really heavy game experience are kind of hardcore. You know, they're, they're elite, and they often, not always, but often turn their noses up and look down at co-ops as not really games. Because it can't be a game if there's not another human being that they are engaged in mortal combat with. Yeah, I think I think that might be a barrier to entry. Although, I mean, certainly Spirit Island got a lot of positive attention. And yeah, Mage Knight the board game is super beloved. So, you know what? Actually, you're right. Maybe there is just like this huge, untapped potential market that is being ignored just because of preconceived notions like what I was just spewing. So, uh, maybe there should be. But... If that's the case, I expect it'll be a while coming because it will be a while before the industry as a whole picks up on this. The modern designer board game industry that really started out in the early aughts uh, took years and years and years and years before they realized just how important two-player gaming was. I mean, nowadays, you know, it, it's it's suicide if you don't include you know two players, you know, by standard, but. Ten years ago, that was not the case. The two players was almost kind of a waste of time. And I think, you know, and maybe in the same way, five, six, seven, ten years from now, you'll see uh, co-ops will have coalesced and solidified enough. I don't suppose you, honey, would you like to see more heavy, heavy-duty co-ops? No. No. Oh, well, there you go. There's a, why would you say that, honey pie? Because I always already find co-ops really um, intimidating. And so heavy ones do not make me feel more excited about them. Okay. Um, I mean, well, heavy doesn't necessarily mean harder. It just means more complex uh, or, you know, yeah. you know, more, more heavy duty lifting. I mean, not necessarily, I mean, your problem with co-ops is you always get demoralized almost immediately if things aren't going your way <laughs> because folks, she's used to playing competitive games against me where somehow everything seems to go her way and she never really has a very viable competition. But suddenly when a game kicks her butt, it's like, oh, this isn't any fun because it doesn't happen otherwise, you see. But, I mean, you like really heavy games. I do tend to like really heavy I games. I mean, Agricola, we were just talking about that, is a very heavy game. It's very complex, a lot of moving parts. What would you think about a cooperative Agricola? <sighs> or would you like rather it. play co-op or competitive Agricola? I don't know. I would have to play it and see. I would have to play it and see! All right. Okay. Sorry, he keeps pointing at the microphone. Like, yes. I can't look at him and talk. I have to look at you guys and talk. That is correct. Just, yeah. He's got a little sign on it that says, um, talk at here. Yes. So that's a reminder to myself to stop saying um so often because it's a bad habit. Oh. And people every once in a while remind me of it. And so look at the sign that says talk to the sign, honey pie. Okay. That would be great. Yeah, you know, I will try to talk to the okay, sign. Okay, off the top of your head, top three games that need to come out. To give an example, here are my top three games. A 4X co-op, an asymmetric... Um, he didn't finish that sentence. Uh, uh, cooperative Space Empire simulation and a heavy low luck 3 to 4x game with more than 10 units per side. Honey, off the top of your head. Not going to happen. Uh, she's just going to go back to eBay. No, I just can't. I'm not that kind of person. Off the top of my head, games that have not happened that need to happen. I mean, it's my, my go-to is always the one that everybody ever asked me, what would I design if somebody put a gun to my head and made me design a board game? Uh, the asymmetry that you're talking about would be very interesting to me. An, asymmet an asymmetrical economic Euro-style simulation um, where, I just said um, see, where everybody is symbiotically linked to everybody else, but everybody is trying to win by being the richest. But you uh, become the richest as an importer, exporter by moving the goods that me as a manufacturer make. And somebody else might be a really strong you know, retail outlet. And we're all trying to become the richest. The game is well balanced against all of that. I would love to see that. As far as I know, the closest has ever come to that is Fallen City of Carez, which had a lot of really cool design elements, but it still it wasn't very good for two. 
And I mean, and, and that's a game design that would implicitly wouldn't work that well with two unless you had really good AI to fill in for the players who wouldn't be there. But that's my number one game. I want to see that game. That's my Grail game. Uh, my number two game. Um, mm, uh, somebody needs to make more expansion content for Star Trek Expeditions, quite frankly, because I love that game, and um, you know, and it has great replay value. But I'd love to see whole new planets, new storylines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It drives me nuts. Um, although, actually, no, no, no. I take it back. I don't want an expansion for it. I want a second edition of it where Kenichia goes back um, and he introdu he he does it as a more modular, automated storytelling system set in the Trek universe using the same basic system, and he dumps the dice, gets rid of the dice for you know conflict resolution because he's better than that. Quite frankly, that's my number two, uh, second edition of Star Trek Expedition, and uh, number three. <laughs> I don't know. I only have two for you, Daniel. That's all I got off the top of my head. Will there be a game that rivals Gloomhaven in the next five years concerning money to content ratio plus good mechanisms? Uh, oh, well, that, that's an, uh, honey, that's a really complex and heavy cooperative game. You like Gloomhaven? You love yeah. Gloomhaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a really heavy game. And it's very complex. There's a ton of stuff going on. Yeah. So, you sure you want to rescind your earlier? I don't want heavy complex games because um, you like Gloomhaven. I do like Gloomhaven. I, I yes, then I will rescind. It. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, let's see here. What was the question? Oh, something that rivals Gloomhaven. I imagine you're going to see people try. I mean, maybe some people would argue that it's already here, but no, no, no. There's nothing that quite matches that. And and the real the really is <laughs> the reality is, and I've said this before. There shouldn't be. You know, Isaac Childress was insane. <laughs> he threw five games worth of content into one box. And yeah, it worked out really well for him, but that's not good business sense. He should have thrown one to two games worth of content in a box and then put out a bunch of expansions. You know, I don't know if Isaac is rich now or not. I have no idea. But Gloomhaven must have made him a lot of money. He would have made a lot more if he'd had a more standard and traditional rollout. Now, maybe, I mean, a big part of his success was the fact that everybody had to back because it's such a big, huge box full of infinite amounts of stuff. I think that's true to a certain extent, but I do think at the end of the day, what brings people or what keeps people uh, playing Gloomhaven more is not the volume, um, but it is the quality. And that would have been there no matter how much stuff he put in the box. So, yeah, I mean, maybe you'll see people try, and I think you'll, and maybe you'll see some successes, but I, I mean, it's hard to make a game that good. I mean, I guess the other one that might rival that, of course, is Kingdom Death Monster, and that, and, he, and, and, you know, that came out before him, and that was also a monster too. So, hey, maybe Daniel, you've hit another untapped market. I don't know. How would you describe a perfect game for you and Jen? What mechanisms would it have? Co-op, competitive, etc. Honey, you must answer. What is your favorite game? Describe it in broad, general terms. Hmm. I think my favorite game has the ability to build a really good engine. Mm-hmm. So it's and, an engine building euro. Yep. Um, that allows me to do lots of things every turn. Mm -hmm. Meaning I don't like doing one little tiny thing every turn. That is frustrating. I mm -hmm. want to do lots of stuff and feel like I'm making progress every turn. Mm -hmm. um, it's got to be pretty. Okay. And I don't know if you guys can hear that. Daisy's out in the garden barking yeah. up her head. Yep. Barking might, off we, her head. We might have to go check that out after you finish describing your perfect game. Yes. Um, How long? Um, An hour and a half. 90 minutes? Yep. All right. And doesn't use standard colors. Okay. I think that would be really good. Um, let's see what else. Um, nobody dies. Okay. Also, nobody dies. There you go. All right. That's a, that's a pretty good list. I'd, I'd go with that as a near-perfect game as well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Now, a different Daniel has questions regarding Board Game Geek browsing. He tends to stick to his subscriptions... Uh, and and uh, games that he hears about or looks up forums on games he owns. Can you walk us through a typical day on Board Game Geek? Honey, what's your typical day on Board Game <laughs> Geek? I do not get on Board Game Geek at all. Right. Uh, so I love yeah. it. I love that it's there. I love the whole concept and everything. But it is like I, I can't even get on Facebook without losing like half a day. 
So I, I just don't go on to geek. Uh, my only, I, I, you mentioned it, I will repeat it. I am 100% reliant on subscriptions. Every time I see a game I'm interested in, I subscribe to it. At this point, I am literally subscribed to thousands of games. And, you know, if, if I let it go, I'll have a thousand unread posts in three or four days, easily, if not sooner. So, I mean, I've got to stay on top of it. Every once in a while, I've, I have to let it go for a week, then things fall apart, and I'm like, ah, I've got 6,000 unread posts. All right, time to just mark them all as red and start over. Um, say la vie. Jen has just left the building to go see what Daisy is barking at because she will not stop barking. All right, um, but she wasn't going to answer this question anyway. So, yeah, it's it's subscriptions, and that's it. It's, you know, uh, subscri subscribe, buy, you know, sorted by stuff. You know, there, obviously there are some threads that I specifically call out. There are a bunch of people, a bunch of designers, uh, a bunch of friends I've got. You know, I, I hit whatever they're posting first, and then I just go to the end and just start working backwards through, um, you know, usually five or six or seven pages worth of posts and just try to spot whatever would be most interesting. Uh, once a week, maybe once every two weeks, and if I'm falling behind, maybe once a month, I use an RSS feed. I actually I use Outlook because I have an RSS feed, and I use that to scour every new game that has been added to Board Game Geek since the last time I looked. And when I'm scanning that, I you know at any given time, usually I've got two or three hundred games I've got to look at, and I've just got to kind of make snap decisions about whether I should subscribe to it, whether I should put it on my wish list. And so when I'm doing that, what's my process? I first I I look at player count. Oh, not not two. Okay, done. Then I look at you know like the key mechanisms. Oh, party game? No, in, not not interested. Memory? Not interested. War? Not interested. There's like a whole bunch of keywords that will just immediately let me eliminate probably 50% of the games I even look at. Actually, what I do is in Outlook, I just uh, I use my touch screen and say. Next game, open link. Next game, or yeah, and then back to Outlook. Next game, open link, back to Outlook. Next game, open link, back to Outlook. I do that for a minute, and then I've got 50 tabs of games opened, and then it takes forever for them to load, and then I go through them one at a time, trying to winnow out any ones that I, that I, you know, I, I, in any way I can that we can dismiss. And then, I, you know, from 50, I'll probably have 10 or 15. Okay, well, I could, you know, we're. 20 that I couldn't get rid of and, uh, you know, for various things that I just d filter them out of. Then I got to start, okay, well, who designed it? Who's the publisher? And okay, well, I mean, or who's the artist? I'm interested because that, oh, there's none of those I know. All right. Now let me read the description. Please let it be a good description that in some way, you know, exemplifies what would make this interesting. That is rarer than hen's teeth on Board Game Geek. The people who are putting that information on do not know how to, you know, capture the attention. Um, and so it's generally very hard. So at that point, most of the stuff ends up getting marked as a four on my wish list means, uh, you know, hey, I'm subscribing to it. It might be interesting. It might not be. I'll have to wait till I hear more. That is probably 95% of what I do on Board Game Geek. Not particularly exciting. Very methodical. Um, alrighty. And... Righty. What is your favorite feature on Board Game Geek and my least favorite? <sighs> um, well, obviously the subscription system, although I guess it'd be my least favorite too because it doesn't make it easy. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what they can do to kind of streamline and, and make that more user-friendly. It's okay, but it's not great. Uh, I mean, may say, I, I just want to see you know the makeover they've done to the game pages be applied to everything else ASAP, please. I know they're working on it. They'll get it done eventually. But yeah, what do I dislike, actively dislike about... The ranking system. Yeah, oh, that's true, yes. I would very much like them to completely eliminate, eradicate all rankings from the last 15 years and come up with a new ranking system that actually works that is actually reflective um, of you know people's true opinions of the game, which means not just having them make some arbitrary determination of 1 to 10. I've, I've done a post about this on in my FAQ.rado.com. I would very much like that to be done, because I do care about the rankings, and I don't <clears throat> believe they've been set up very well at all. Um, you know, I mean, they, they, are, they are literally broken. Uh, as currently described, and that ju that just kind of bugs me because I do I'm 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 a rankophile. I like ranking things. 
Uh, I thought you heard mentioned we were going to revamp the site. Usually, can you talk about that? Oh, I mean, I have no inside information. They have revamped it. They'll continue to revamp it. I'm sure it'll be an improvement. Daniel also has a nephew who doesn't like losing, so the sister lets him win. Sometimes when playing, which breaks my heart, uh, if he's going to be honest, he know he knows that I that we play of our life partners. Longtime listeners know that Jen and I are quite compatible gamers. What advice would you give to someone dealing with conflict? Uh, whether it is someone who is a sore loser or winner, or someone who is too aggressive, or maybe only having fun if they are winning. I want to be a good gaming dad and uncle, and I'm trying to bring gaming back to family gatherings. Please help! Oh, yeah, that's hard. Mm. That is very hard. Uh, it, well, I mean, I don't know. It, it is, is your sister doing it because the kid is being a jerk if he loses? Right. With someone dealing with... All right. He has a nephew who doesn't like losing. Yeah, okay, yeah. So he doesn't like losing, and so the sister just lets him win. So, yeah, that's a problem. But So, okay, so how do you deal with that? If Is it is it yeah, just... You have a niece and nephew, and if you were to play a game with them and you saw them being poor sports, what would you do? I'd call him out on it, actually. I that's would... not going to engender more gaming, is it? No, but it would make them aware of what they're doing. <sighs> yeah. Um... I don't know. The best thing I, I, I don't could... know. I think actually, how old is the nephew? Because sometimes, if if they're young, yeah, they do need to have a little bit of maybe extra help. I'm going to assume the nephew is eight to eleven years old. To mm. take that away from you, they yeah, yes, are saying, yeah, let the three year olds win, sure, but or the four year olds. Well, I don't know. Maybe even yeah, even up to twelve or thirteen years old. Ooh, maybe to, just to again foster a positive experience where they're learning how to use logic or math or, you know. Well, you know, the next whatever. time we're playing, please consider me to be an 11 to 12 year old. Because <laughs> I wouldn't mind winning every once in a while. Jeez. Oh, dear. Um, yeah, I, that's a really hard one. I think it really depends on the parenting style that's going on in the house as well. Me personally, I don't want to play with 11 or 12 or 8 year olds, but that's just me. But if I were in a situation like that, the best thing I could think of would simply to be as uh, supportive as possible, not to throw the game, but, you know, as they start falling behind, just try to be really positive and upbeat and accentuate what they're doing well and say, oh, yeah, boy, that, boy, you know, that, that, that really snuck up on you. That really, oh, I bet that hurts. But tell you what, next time try to do this. I guess something like that. I don't know if he's going to be petulant about it. I don't know. That's tough. I, I know nothing about kids, Daniel. You are so talking to the wrong guy. I would suggest mm -hmm. asking Tom Vassell about that since he yeah. has 18 children or 18,000. I'm not sure how many, but I'm sure he's had to <laughs> deal with that between. on more than one occasion. But you know what? I don't know. Maybe just sometimes gaming isn't for everybody. Maybe. I'm not sure. That's a tough one. Mm. Have you had a chance to play Gloomhaven to the table lately? No. Oh, no. And, yeah, no. Uh, is there a custom component you could add to the Gloomhaven experience? What would you consider? For those of you who haven't played it, how much time do you dedicate? Oh, well, when we do play, it's probably two or three hours. Um, although sometimes upwards of five, because when we were playing regularly, we would play like two adventures back to back and just like all, you know, Sunday was always just devoted to that and nothing else. And we did that for probably half a year. Yep. Um, what would you like to see? What customized components would you like to add to Gloomhaven, honey? Gosh, I kind of think we've already got a lot of customized components, and they do make the game a lot more fun. Um, yep. We got them from. Um, well, we have painted Chad. miniatures. Yeah. And we you know, have that nice insert. We've got like the little plastic doors that open and close. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, I've seen. We've yep. got various glass components as well that yep, I've made yep, to sure, go sure. with our um, pets and things. I don't know. What else could there be? Well, I mean, you've probably never seen them. There are these very cool, like, modular dungeon terrain things you can get that look like little tiny, you know, they've got walls and cobblestone floors and stuff like that, but you can just snap them together and make any size you want. Hmm. I guess something like that would be awesome. Probably somebody has made a full replicate all the potential dungeon layouts you would need with this snap-together modular system. If they haven't, they're missing a trick. So there'd be that, but I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm really I mean I do like our painted minis, but I'm just not that. I mean, I still like the two sided uh, standees from Legends of Andor better. Standees that 
That, that'd be my number one thing. Um, would be standees for all the monsters that have fronts and backs. It's a dumb little thing, but it adds so much. Um, because you get to see the original nice, great-looking art, but you get to have that sense of people are moving forward or away from things. That's a dumb little thing, but I would like to see that. As far as I know, nobody's done it besides Legends of Andor, and it's so obvious. Yes, it doubles the art, but it's not going to be that. I mean, I think it has so much impact for not too terribly much you know, uh, income. I think that's definitely worth it. Okay, Morgan. Morgan says, now they're back in the PNW, <laughs> hopefully getting settled. Are we going to go to PAX West at the end of August? Seeing as how it's now <laughs> September 21st, I think you have your answer, Morgan. The answer was no. She and her husband went. It was their first convention. Didn't know what to expect. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm very late to the party, Morgan. Let's see. Do we have any insight? If we're going, it'd be super cool to say hi. No. Sorry. Didn't go, Morgan. Maybe next year. I don't know. I mean, as I understand it, PAX, is st PAX West is still predominantly a video game one, right? You want to go to PAX Unplugged if you want the the board game pencil and paper one and that's back east isn't it i hope it went well for you morgan you should tell us right in yes uh, um i only went once years ago and it had a very very tiny board game component at that point i was there you know demoing brink so i don't know maybe uh, are you are we going to go to that game girl con at the end of October? Geek Girl. Geek, yes. Are we going to go to that? I haven't even looked at it because we only just decided we're not going to Essen. True. So. So, all right. Hey, along the same line, Stacy wonders if we'll be ascending, attending Sasquatch. She and her sister got invites and are looking Aww. forward to seeing me or Jen. That would be awesome to meet you guys. They have been um, really amazing people and lovely backers for a long time. It would be wonderful to meet you guys. Well, honey, do you want to go to Sasquatch? I don't know. I don't know exactly when it is. It's sometime, I think it's in November, probably first or second week, sometime in November, I'm not sure. And it's a very small invite-only affair. Yeah. It's probably only like, I don't know, 50 people, 60 people, mm. probably less than 100. There's no retail outlet at all. It's basically put together by some people who come back from Essen with all the games. Oh, and right. they bring them all, so it's a chance for everybody to get to play the games six months before they come out in America. Wow, that's pretty cool. So, would you want to go to that? It's basically, I, I think, two, three, or four days of just nonstop, 24 hours a day, of just playing as many of those hot, cool new games from Essen as possible. Um, well, is it held, like, in a hotel? or? I believe so, yes. Huh. It's somewhere in Seattle. Well, I would certainly consider that. That would be, um, because we're not going to Essen. So, huh. this is a lot closer. I think that might be, I, don't, I imagine you could probably see if somebody might invite you. Uh, well, apparently Stacy could get us in. Although she already is uh, taking her sister. <laughs> so dump your sister, Stacy, and bring us. <laughs> well, or, or just bring him. <laughs> because, yeah. I don't know. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, no, I'm very keen on going. Definitely. Okay. But uh, we haven't got any invites yet. Uh, I've been meaning to ask Joel Eddy about it because I know he goes and he might be able to get us in. Is Joel in the area? Joel lives in Spokane or somewhere in the Spokane area. Yes, is I, know it's, near I know it's Spokane. I know it's Spokane. Yeah. Okay. So he lives in Eastern Washington somewhere. I'm not sure where. Okay. And I know he goes to it. Next up, Mario says, Last episode, you said that you'd give up more easily board games for TV. Uh, shock! Mic drop. That got me curious. I would drop board games before I would drop television. Do you think that starting to do Rado Runs Through as a 40-hour-a-week job, as you've mentioned, has influenced you on that answer? Do you think... That if you only did run-throughs once in a while as part of a hobby and not your job, would the answer be different? I don't think so. I think at the end of the day, I enjoy television more than I enjoy board games. i just be honest. I do. And if I had to choose one, I would... Uh, TV is so much easier. <laughs> yes. And he is lazy. So I am a lazy day. Let daisy. us just put that in the mix. Mm-hmm. So... Because you're looking at something that's a lot of hard work because he's got to troll through. No, all but, the, but that's stuff. his point. If, he's if, read I were, the manuals. if I were a normal person, we wouldn't be playing you know over 200 new games every year. Yeah, but he was board gaming still takes some effort. You've got to find be, the right thing. You've got to read the manual. Yeah, but it would be significantly less effort. Significantly. All right. Well, a, roughly a, a third or a quarter or a fifth or a tenth of the effort. If you were only playing, if we we're only playing 20 games a year, right? That would be a tenth of the effort. Okay. Yes. 10% of the effort. <coughs> so, now answer the question. I would still keep TV over board games. Okay. There's your answer. I'd, yeah. I mean, it's, and it's it's not a reflection of getting burned out or, or the work. I, it's, it's, I, 
I enjoy watching uh, Better Call Saul more than I enjoy playing Gloomhaven. Or Pandemic. Just trying to think of one of my favorite TV shows and one of my favorite board games. And if I had to pick one, I would rather see Better Call Saul through to the end. Because I really, 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 really love that. I really, 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 notice there was one less really in there, <laughs> love board games. So that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah, but... Yeah, but, I'm not watching Better Call Saul with you. I know. I so, wish you. I wish you were. It's a shame, but it's just that good. Well, why am I not watching it? Because you have certain things that you like and certain things that you don't like. And Better Call Saul is all about the things I don't like. Yes, the darker side of the human experience. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, if it's not shiny, happy people, Jen's not interested. Uh, I'm sure. All right. Let's see here. How has the feedback been for Rundown since you started them? I still prefer to see run-throughs, uh, but I was interested to know the response from the public. And how do you feel about your side of the matter? Oh, well, obviously, they're a lot easier to do, and it means I can cover a lot more stuff. And that, more than anything else, is what I like about them, because it gives me a shot at not keeping a game on my shelf for literally a year before I get it filmed. And it's good. the first big test for that is going to be after Essen. I mean, I still have games from last year's Essen that we haven't played, let alone filmed. And I feel really terrible about that because they gave me that game to review, and I'm failing them. So, the rundowns have the potential to be a real lifesaver because I can't possibly, it would be physically impossible to run through everything that comes out. Rundowns give me that option. That said, this month I have absolutely fallen on my face and failed to uh, achieve that because, well, because it's the busiest time of the year for Jen when it boils right down to it. Jen has had to spend so much time now that she's finally, after six months, gotten her glass studio back up and running that we, I was hoping this was going to be the month that was going to explode. <laughs> but in fact, this is going to be a really bad month. I, I was doing better in England because... Jen had more time to play games with me because she couldn't do as much work. But now that her studio is back to 95% functionality, she has just been burning the midnight oil yeah. and hopefully not burning her fingers on that 2,000 degree torch. <laughs> and so it's been a really, really, really slow month. Uh, before I started filming this, I was playing Kick-Ass by myself, solo, because I figure, okay, hey, I'll just start trying to get some co-op games played solo so I can start filming them because Jen just isn't available. But... After this Essen run is out of the way, things should calm back down. Although not quite, because then she's going to have her Christmas rush. Come January, February is when things are really going to slow down quite a bit for her. Yeah. And then that's when hopefully, and when I'm sitting on a queue of over 100 games that are still burning a hole in my shelf from Essen, <laughs> that's when they'll really you know, come to the fore. And be very, very important as a tool for me to sleep better at night knowing that I'm not screwing over... Freedom and Freeze. I still haven't done the Fear Flea Fortress games. And I've had them since October. I've had them for almost a year now. Just off the top of my head. So, that's why I like them. And oh my gosh, they're so much easier to do. So I like them for that reason. In terms of your response, it's been pretty much... I mean, I think the overwhelming majority is people don't notice the difference. Because you have to understand, most people don't watch the extended playthroughs. Most people don't watch the final thoughts. Most people only watch about half or two-thirds of the basic gameplay run-through. They watch me play through maybe not even a full turn. They say, okay, I got it. I looked at it. I, I kind of got a sense, and they, they and they stop watching. And most people only watch for under 10 minutes. So that's why I figured most people would be perfectly fine with run-throughs, which I'm trying to get done in under 10 minutes, although the last few I've kind of been cheating, and now it's, i got to get under 15 minutes. And I don't know if it's going to... i got to get under 20 minutes. I'm, I'm really getting worse and worse about <laughs> it. Um, but the majority of the audience, you know, they're perfect for that purpose. So I think for most part, uh, people are like, oh, well, I... Then I'll, I'll watch the whole thing. I didn't realize. Oh, that's nice. Um, some people were unhappy. Some people were very, very happy. And I, for the most part, it just really didn't make a difference for the majority of the audience. Ah, right. Good questions, though. Sorry you don't like them, Mario. Uh, but they are getting longer, so that means you're probably liking them more. Okay. Uh, David wonders, uh, we mentioned during the Gen Con podcast that we haven't played The Mind. Has that been rectified? No, it is not. If not, he can assure us that it plays great at all players count, including two. I've, I've, I have no reason to doubt that. I've just It's never shown up on my radar somehow. 
Uh, if you have played it, would you recommend it to people who claim the mind? How would you respond to people who play claim that the mind isn't a game? I would say that is silly sauce. That is a ridiculous statement to say. I could go and look up the Webster's or the Google definition of game and prove that it is in fact a game. Um, and it's not just an activity. Honey, you remember Hanabi? Yes. Uh, you know, you hold the cards, yes. you look away from them. Yes. There are people out there who say Hanabi isn't a game. It's an activity. It's a shared activity. It's not a game. Hmm. Respond to that. Why does it matter what we call it? <laughs> Because these are the things people argue about on Board Game Geek. Oh, um, I don't care. So <laughs> call it what you want. If, you, if it's fun, play it. Would you... Or activate it. Okay. Would you agree or disagree that Hanabi is a, is a game? Or would you consider it an activity? Um, I don't know. I'd have to get into the semantics of what a game it is. is. It's a 100% semantic argument that's been going on for quite a while. Yeah. Ever since I think, I think it was Hanabi that Tom Vassell just out of the blue said, yeah, I just don't know. It doesn't seem like it's a game. Seems like it's an activity. And then he did, I think uh, several people said that for the mind as well. I think it's ridiculous. I was a professional game maker for <laughs> a quarter of a century. So I think I know what I'm talking about when I say it's a game. Boom. Mic drop. Moving on <laughs> to Alex. Who says, hey, do you ever run through games without ever playing them with Jen? Yes. If so, do games shine when playing by yourself? Or do you need Jen to really bring out the sparkle that a game has to offer? Ah. Uh, yes. Sparkle? Or no, no, no. Sparkle, uh, sparkle. To answer that question, yes, it is a shame. I would always rather play a game with Jen. Or almost without exception. And sometimes I do, uh, pretty much just for co-op games. Or, you know, obviously for solo games, I've done a few run-throughs for that. But there have occasionally been cooperative games where, yeah, she's just never coming down from her glass tower. <laughs> uh, she will not let it go. And so I just have to, i got to film this thing. So, I, you know, I, was that true? I almost, I think that almost happened with Gloomhaven. Did that happen? With I know that was a thing. And I don't remember. I, I, I'd have to go back and look if if I did actually play it with Gloomhaven with her before. I might not have. I'm not sure. It happens, and it's definitely better. But you know what? I have played so many, at this point, literally thousands of hours of games with Jen now. I don't think that's an exaggeration, probably. No, I wouldn't think so. That I, you know, if she's not there, I can still this intuit is, what the experience would yeah, be. Yeah, this is the problem is when we play together, sometimes he knows me so well. He, he wins because he knows what I'm going to do. <laughs> Especially things like uh, what are those games where you have to um, hide hide your movement? That's the one type of game that I can be called upon to beat Jen. Normally, is one where deduction of your opponent's moves are a big part, mm -hmm. and those that's a rare thing we play. We don't we generally tend to play live and let live euros where we're both trying to do our own thing, and then it turns out my thing is crap <laughs> by comparison to hers. Oh dear! Um, <laughs> but then we play these other ones where he's he already. He, I don't even have to bother. The no, actually, the, I can't remember what it was. There was a game um, of not too long ago, back I think this year when we were still in Malta. I played. I did a run through for, and I even might have mentioned this in the final thoughts. Oh, I know what it was. No, it was from last year. It was that game where one player is the evil space monster plan, and the other person is trying to move around, and you had the cards you had to move to, and um, you know, and the. And the Space planet monster had to guess where you were going to go, yeah. and then you revealed. Yep. And you know, and I was totally trouncing her. And then all of a sudden, she started winning. And I'm like, oh. and she said, yeah, I just started literally um, randomly choosing where to go. <laughs> yes. I just started rolling a die in my head and just went <laughs> randomly. And then suddenly, I had a chance. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess we're going to stop playing this game then. <laughs> I would consider that cheating, for the record. Oh, um, I would say it's giving me a Yeah, because it literally put me at a disadvantage because I was making decisions based on what I knew would be her first, second, and third, and when she would decide to zag instead of zig and all that. Because <laughs> I can usually get that with a pretty high degree of accuracy. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm fairly predictable, apparently. <laughs> all righty. Jen asks... Are you happy or unhappy with how popular modern board gaming has become? No, oh, I'm very happy. I am as well. I would like it to be even more popular because I tell people what my husband does and they look at me like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so I'd like it to become ubiquitous. All right. Do you think there's still a monopoly style stigma related uh, to the hobby? Yes. yes. Yes, of course there is. Uh, no, we, we, we are a blip. We are the tiniest moat, the tiniest speck. 
we're we're not even big enough to be one of those lampet fish that latches onto the size of a great white shark. We're not even that compared to video games or movies or television or books or live performance or music or anything. We 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 got a long mountain to climb. All righty. A high high mountain. High mountain to climb. A long road to walk. Yes. Up a high mountain to climb. <laughs> um, and I think that's fine. A I, I, it's, road to hoe. I'm not worried if we don't get there anytime soon. There are already far too many games coming out as it is. Um, well, that's always funny. It always kind of confuses me that how people who do not, for a living, play board games complain about, there's just too many games coming out. I, you know, I never see people complain about, there's too many movies. I must watch all the movies. Mm. I must read every book. Oh, it's like, wh why? Nobody says I must read every book. Why does everybody say I must play every game? It's just, it's time to let that go. We have <laughs> gotten farther enough along. I mean, I know 10 years ago that was the case when literally less than 50 good games would come out a year. And I guess there yeah. people just still have a, a well, I, I've still got to see everything that the industry has to offer. No, you don't. Just find a few games and enjoy them. Doesn't, you don't have to. I have to. You don't have to. All right, sorry. That well, was... and you've already heard how he has to win winnow everything down anyway. Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah, I'm look. I'm desperate for a reason not to play a game. Um, okay. Tyler has a question about Pandemic Legacy. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about doing a full spoiler tastic final thoughts video or podcast for Pandemic Legacy season two? I'd love to hear your thoughts about what Jen and I are thought about. Uh, uh, I don't think so. I haven't because. Oh, in part because we just didn't like it as much. And I talked about that at great length in my spoiler-free one. <laughs> but yeah, I never... And it, at this point, it's too long. I don't... I don't. I mean, one, we don't have it anymore. We didn't keep it. And uh, yeah. There, I mean, I do... Do you, what, do you remember Pandemic Legacy 2? Do you remember anything about it? Remember we, we had to make our own characters? I was Makawena. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you were... And then eventually you... Oh, no, you were Alpha because you took my character and then would never stop using it. And, yeah, that was good. Um, and, you know, and, and you, you had to explore the world and the map with the big map stickers. And, yeah. And we can't say much more than that because then we'd go into spoiler territory. That's known right from the get-go that there are... The map, the world has to be explored and you make your own character from scratch. Yeah, do, do you remember any of the big twists and turns? No. But do you remember any of the big twists and turns of Pandemic? The uh, first Legacy. Probably, but uh, I, I'm just not. That's not the way my brain works. Yeah, I would have to. I'd have to do a lot of research and go back and look up what all the twists and turns were. Um, it, it was good. The fundamental problem was it was the base game out of the box was not as good as regular Pandemic, and so the entire scaffolding that the entire experience was built on was just a little bit weaker, and so it just wasn't quite as memorable. And yeah, and because of that, I don't think I'll ever go back. Uh, Tyler, sorry about that. Let's see. And where do you think Pandemic Legacy will go for Season 3? Ooh, I don't care. <laughs> I just want it to come out. <laughs> I And honestly, I'm kind of the same. I genuinely do not want to know. I, oh, I, I remember I got the Dice Tower kind of ticked at me because I complained about how they talked about spoilers when, I, when they were doing one thing. And they said, it's not spoilers because Matt Leacock mentioned it in an interview. And I'm like, I don't care if you mentioned it. I avoid all the interviews. I want to go in knowing nothing. Um, and, and the same thing is true for Pandemic Legacy 3. I am Season 3, I don't want to know. I don't want to think about it. I want to be surprised and delighted every step of the way. Okay. <laughs> Eugene wonders... He, he's calling you Rod the Bod. Eugene inter <laughs> opens with Rod the Bod. Just checking in. <laughs> Um, you seem to be down Rondo lately. Rondo the Bondo. Kind of low. Looking forward to the next podcast. Question for the podcast. Uh, what have you been up to? And how's settling in Washington going? Uh, so this was sent a month ago. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we're... Yeah, that was uh, on August 17th. And... Uh, well, I was just going to say, if you watch our recent Q&A, you would know. But, of course, that's only for Patreon backers. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the Ramble, where we actually did a full tour of our entire new home and talked about our experiences, you cool. would know. But that was also only for people who go on to Patreon.com and give us $2. <laughs> you only have to do it once. Just give $2. Everything unlocks. You can unlock it and then just turn off the subscription and you'll see everything. Um, so, the information is there. 
Uh, Eugene. Uh, uh, but, Bo Beater. Let's see. Yeah, I feel kind of weird repeating it all because we've talked about it at great length now to the subscribers because that's what everybody keeps asking about when we did that Q&A the other day. Um, things that are going good. We have, Jen has been working, like, well, we just talked about it. Jen's been working like crazy. I have been trying to catch up with my ridiculous queue that built up. And it's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. And uh, I'd like to say, hey, after Essen, it's going to slow down. But then that's when a cavalcade of games is going to come in. And that's when a cavalcade of Christmas orders for her is going to come in. Yep. So, yeah, we just got to punch on through to the other side. But don't worry, I'm doing fine, Eugene. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Thomas wonders, how, do you often take breaks while playing very long games? Do you ever start one day and finish on another? No. Eh, sometimes. not, But not often. He asks often. It's not often. No. Uh, um, and do we take breaks during game? Yeah, we'll um, cook dinner. Or... or a phone call or the dog is barking. Or... Yeah. <clears throat> but no, once we're down, we're, you know... We're in it to win it. We have to get up sometimes and get a bowl of pistachios. Yeah, but yeah, we, we tend to see it through. And, you know, in large part, I think we can do that because it's just the two of us. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, that, that makes a big, big difference. Every time we ever play with more than two, we're always wondering, how do people do this? Yeah, because This they... is so hard. These are nice people. We're <laughs> enjoying our time with them, but this literally takes twice as long. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Can you think of a game that has that has two small components? In general, do you prefer a game that takes less space on the table but maybe lacks detail, or a game with a huge board that tells a story but to the detriment of the ease of play? Yeah, I don't like it when there's so much stuff on a card and it's all in tiny font. Mm -hmm. That is a real downer for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I'm sitting far enough away from wherever the central stuff is that it is it's just a hassle. If you have to, like, stand up and go look at the card or something. So, yes, I would say readability is very important. All right. What about actual physical size? Um, no, I, I think as long as it's appropriate to the game and um, readable. I'll be honest. I actually like a gigantic board. I mean, if they're a pain in the butt, and they cause all kinds of problems for me for filming. <laughs> but if, if I were to put aside my day job... I, I love the 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 opulent sprawl of a gigantic board consuming game. I, I I think you put it brilliantly when you say that you know it tells a story, um, you know to the detriment of usability. That's true, but I love it. Um, I don't know if you remember we used to have Middle Earth Quest, uh, and I would have to play as Sauron and you would play as a couple, and yeah. it was literally two boards put next to each other to do all of Middle Earth. It was yeah. so gigantic. I loved it. And I'm just thinking about like tiny epic kingdoms and things like that. On the opposite end? Yeah, yeah, and I just enjoy those so much. Yeah, sure. I mean, I like that too. I mean, I, I love a clever clockwork little thing that somehow, how did you get so much into so little space? Yeah. I love that too, but I really enjoy I, I love a big, gigantic game. But I hate them because they're a pain in the butt to film. Um, and I wish they'd all stop doing it. Well, and also, when you've got all that real estate to look at, there's a lot of stuff to have to look at and yeah. read and sort out yeah. and remember. I see. Oh, and the other question: Can you think of a game that has two small components? <clears throat> um, mm. um, 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 no, because I, I know there have been some games where I've seen others complain about these cubes are too tiny. They're ridiculous, and I, and I would agree that they're ridiculously small. But I would say, oh, look how sweet and adorable they are. They're so adorable. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I have decent prestidigitation. I can handle picking up a tiny. You know, I mean, I guess my earlier days of playing Operation have paid off. <laughs> Or more like probably playing lots of video games. So no, I, I don't know that I would, could think of a game where I said, yeah, these are this, this, these dice, these cardboard chits, these are just too small. There are a couple of games I think that we have played. One of them is Harbor, where yeah. you have all of those chits that have to get you know in little. I think we've got them in little boxes or something, and those are sometimes a hassle to. Oh no, you're you're thinking of Shipyard. Oh okay. I know what you're thinking of, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. But she's thinking of Shipyard, but the same, yeah. A, a game that, you know, that used to be a case. There was kind of a time five or six years ago where that was kind of the norm that, hey, Agricola did it, Lahav did it, let's throw in 50 bajillion tokens. Yeah. And pay, people and have to go small. out to the dollar store and buy a bunch of little plastic cubbies to keep these all in. Yeah. So I would say that would be my only, you know, as I'm thinking back on all the things, that would be my only. Hmm. Thought about that. Yeah, that's fair enough. I'll, uh, that doesn't bother me at all. 
But then I'm the guy who just basically dumps them all into a big gigantic pile anyway, <laughs> and would drive any uh, mm. yeah, yeah, drive certain people nuts. Or you go and buy little containers at the dollar store. Yeah. If you could interview any board game designer for your show, who would it be? Ignoring language barrier. And what would be the first three questions you would like to ask? Honey, can you think of any question you'd like to ask any designer of any game based on the game? Because no. you just don't care, right? Nope. I think they're doing good work. Just continue. Ah, oh, jeez. Ah, oh, jeez. Jeez. That's a tough question. You're, 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 these are not softballs, Thomas. Come on, man. Give me a break. <laughs> oh, boy. A designer I would like to... I mean, I really like, you know, Vlada Shavadl. Maybe him. I think I'd probably like to talk to him about his process for doing rule books because they're so entertaining and so much fun. And I know he's he himself is really heavily involved in that process. And, but no, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, in theory, I should want to talk about... I mean, I, 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 if I had to do an interview with any designer, it'd probably be the same basic question. It doesn't matter who they are. I'd be interested in what is their process, you know, theme before mechanisms or vice versa. And I'd probably just try to drill down and get interesting anecdotes, um, you know, that yeah. came up during the development of whatever game they were making just because it'd be for some fun trivia if I really liked the game. So that would be the same questions I would ask of anybody. And yeah, if I mean, and I mean, I have actually sat down and had a brief conversation with Stefan Feld, and his he is very self conscious about his poor English, and that was kind of a bummer, um, because yeah. So I'd probably, I guess, I'd say Stefan Feld, and I would just, I if, in his case, I would like to talk about the story behind that prolific explosion he had a few years ago, where I think he had like four or five or six games all come out within the space of a year and a half. And, uh, you know, his probably, I know he, his number one tester is his wife. I'd probably want to talk to him about that. That would be really interesting. And yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and, and yeah. And yeah, I would also <laughs> like to talk about now that you made me think about it, I would like to talk to him about what I have identified in kind of, uh, you know, changes in the overall tenor of his design approach. Uh, that I've seen, and you know, and the same thing for Uwe Rosenberg. I would love to talk to Uwe Rosenberg. What happened to the Rosenberg shackles? And because every game he puts out now, it's just they're wide open, do whatever you want, and you know, he doesn't really, you know, constrain gamers much anymore. What? Why has that happened? Is that a reflection of him and his own gaming tastes, or you know, that kind of stuff? Okay. If I had to revisit my top 10 worker placement games, is there any game you, you would squeeze in? Oh, sure. I, I, I imagine there probably would be. But I'd have to sit down for an hour and think about it and do a search. So I will answer your question very literally and say, outcome is likely. <laughs> what made you choose Shadow and Crossfire before Gloomhaven in your top three games of all time? Is it mainly that Gloomhaven is too long? Yes, it's... it's it's, it's le That pandemic is number one. Because of the sh because of the existence of legacy and because of the sheer wealth of options that it has now, never mind the fact that we get to play when we play on a board that Jen and I designed through our play. Uh, that's why it's my number one. Shadowrun Crossfire number two is number two because it's great, but also because Gloomhaven is longer than I would like it to be. And at the end of the day, there are some decisions that Isaac made in the design of that game that I did just make my blood boil that I, I'm just livid about, that I think are just fundamentally flawed on a really significant level. And as amazing as that game is, those things drag it down just ever so much so that Shadowrun Crossfire can sneak in and take the win from it. So, yeah. Have you ever posted a picture of your Gloomhaven page in miniatures? I've posted a whole video about it, <laughs> actually. Uh, do us probably do a Google search for Rado Painted Miniatures or Gloom, Rado Painted Gloomhaven Miniatures, and you'll find it. Oh, that was a really depressing video. Because the thing is, they did it for me for free, just because they liked the show. And so they did it, like, super fast. They banged every one of them out in, like, I don't know, two or three hours or something like that. And I thought they were awesome, and I posted a video saying, look how awesome these guys are. And then, like, every snooty miniature painter in the universe came out of the woodwork and said how crap it all was. Oh. And it was so depressing. Oh, my God, it was so depressing. And that made me realize, I want nothing to do with miniature painters. If uh, that was representative of that particular hobby. I'm sure it's not. I'm sure that's unfair. Um, but man, that was a dark chapter. 
Uh, but still, the video's up if you want to go check it out. Uh, what was the time where you were closest to stopping Rado Runs Through? What went on in your head at that time? And how did Jen feel about it? I, it that, that hasn't happened. I have never come close to stopping. Because I need to do it because it's my job. And I don't want to go do a real job. Um, I mean, yeah. Uh, maybe there was a window briefly where it wasn't my job and I didn't need to do it. But that window must have been so short I don't even remember it. Yeah, now that we're here. Yeah, and now that we're here, it would be impossible. I, I, it is unthinkable for me to stop auto runs through because I know what that means I would have to do. I'd have to go get a real job, and I don't want to do that. So it hasn't happened as yet. Okay, Jarrett. Hi, Jarrett. Hey, thanks for supporting on Patreon. You're a good man, and I appreciate you and everybody else. And I don't say it enough. Let's see here. <clears throat> My wife hates table talk. Uh, for example, if I were to say something out loud like, well... I don't just want to give you the card and maybe hand you those three points, but mm, uh, and it drives her nuts. Question is, oh. what is the dialogue like for you and Jen during games? So she doesn't want him chatting about He wants his... him to shut the hell up so she can think about what she's trying oh, to do. okay. I would assume. You know, even if it's just kind of friendly chit-chat, she's like, zip, zip, it, <laughs> zip, it, zip. Is what she says, I'm sure, because that drives mm. her nuts. Um, so he wants to know what kind of tater tot do we have. I realize Did the you type say tater tot? of tater tot. No, we I, have no I, tater tots. Actually, unfortunately, I said tater tatter. <laughs> I meant to say table chatter, but it came out table tatter. Is tater what I tots, said. Tater tatters. Tater tatter. Uh, I realize mm. the type of game often dictates the amount of time spent in your own head. But does Jen ever tell you just to basically shut up and play the game? <clears throat> I think That's occasionally I do. Tell him to knock it off. Um, but I think actually we both do kind of just talk out loud oftentimes. And um, that was a, I mean, obviously he does that anyway because he's doing a run through um, or preparing to do a run through. And um, we've done some live plays. And so I had to get to the point where I, I felt comfortable verbalizing what I was thinking. So yeah, that did not come naturally for you at all. No, and in fact, I when I was growing up playing games, you would never tell anybody your strategy. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's craziness. It took a long time for me to be able to tell him anything because <laughs> I was going to win. Shark. I was going to win. Damn it, she's a shark. Um, but I think we've been playing long enough that actually it's it's more the playing of the game that matters than the winning, and he's going to poo poo that. But I think that is the truth. I think that's easy to say when you always win. Daisy's giving him a high five right now. <laughs> Hi, Daisy. Yeah. We stopped her from barking by bringing her in. <clears throat> yep, that works. And now she's adorable. Yep. So um, I, I don't mind his table chatter. Occasionally he will just go over the options that I already know. Yeah, that's the and thing. And that drives me crazy. Yeah, and it's, so, it's pointless. And I know, I, I, I usually, I hopefully I catch myself. Yeah. You, and I'll just like, better. and what I just said was completely pointless. And why did I say it? Is what I end up trailing off when I do that. <laughs> because it is. It's, or it's, it's, I'm just repeating myself. Uh, and now I have just told you about how you can do that for the third time. Why aren't you doing it? It's so obvious. Just do it. Because I'm You're thinking about something minutes. else. No, I'm going to do it my way and I'll win. <laughs> hey, well, yeah. yeah, the last time I took advice from him, I lost. So <laughs> <laughs> we won't be doing that again. No, but, but, no, but it, you, it was a close second, as I recall. Um, you thought, oh, this advice was so terrible. I've completely outed. I've lost the entire game. I might as well quit now. And then you went on ahead and just barely lost by nano. I don't remember. Yeah, I do. I always remember. I do remember being frustrated because I took his advice and my thing was tied up for five turns. Yeah, but it worked out in the end. Yeah, it was all right. All righty. It um, was a perfectly viable strategy. Yeah, and actually, I think I think it's been good for me to learn how to talk about my strategy to him um, because... It just makes the whole thing less precious. You know, it's not like I've got the, the grand secret pl master plan over here. So it's good. Yeah. Yeah. I and, agree. and so essentially we're sharing an experience even more so rather than him just sort of directing comments at me and <laughs> um, strategies and stuff. Yeah. Castles of Burgundy, Jarrett would also like to ask about. How did you get that out of COB? It's Castles of Burgundy. Everybody knows Castle of Burgundy. Couldn't is it be corn on the cob? No, that would be COTB. <laughs> All, right. All right. So they recently introduced. Is this the same Jarrett? I think it is. Yes. Recently introduced his wife to Burgundy, 
It's fantastic. And it's uh, he's now working his way up to Trajan. Good job, Jarrett. That is the way to go. But uh, he believes in his wife's situation that Castle Burgundy the Dice Game was the gateway that got her over the hump into <laughs> Burgundy proper. Once you grasped the Dice Game, was having fun, you brought out Burgundy, and so much of the symbolism and whatnot was similar. She liked it, and you played it twice the same day. Anyway, she wanted to share a story. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> right, I figured there'd be a question here. All right, but I just want to share the story in case somebody else is trying to get Castles of Burgundy to the table that Castles of Burgundy, the dice game, is a good gateway drug. I would agree with that. More so than Castles of Burgundy, the card game, which has some problems. And actually, Castles of Burgundy, the card game, did not make it back from Malta. and but, but the dice game did. I agree. Good recommendation, Jarrett. And finally, Jason says... No, not that Jason. Another Jason. Have you found any board games that you bought or haven't bought, but were good, at the local thrift stores in the Pacific Northwest. Oh. <laughs> I know there are quite a few good finds. And uh, no. we I, 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 Obviously, he heard us mention that we've just been going crazy the, for Goodwills and Salvation is, Armies and stuff like that. We did meet a fan at a Goodwill. Yes, the first time <laughs> ever that I have been approached with a... Excuse me, are you Rotto? Outside, yeah. outside of a board game convention happened... About a month ago, at a Goodwill <laughs> um, here in Southern Washington State, completely out of the blue, yep. total surprise. Did not expect it. Never had that happen ever. And he was a nice guy. And he said, "Don't bother checking out the board games. Are already pretty to clean." I'm like that was <laughs> really. He said, "Yeah, because uh, yeah. I mean, you're right. Apparently, that's a that's a thing in America." That you can find good, and he listed several games that he had found. I subsequently went over and didn't find anything. <laughs> uh, and I have yet to find anything, but I've been looking. So far, I haven't found anything. Uh, um, but I, I, I have been very, very impressed. So far, I have found some things, but they're invariably things we have. Yeah. I mean, the, really, the reality is I'm probably not going to find anything we don't already have or have had, had at one point. So I'm, But it's still fun to look uh, and be very, very impressed. And thrift stores for the win. Well, gosh, there's, so, there's just good stuff. Yes, there is. Good stuff. And that, folks, we are done with the gaming-related questions and answers. Hope you had a good time. And if you're done, you're out C. You don't want to hear anything about TV or politics or whatever people might ask about, then I'm just going to say thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you next month when it's going to be again later in the month probably a week before Essen, because it's going to be an all-Essen preview show. Even though I won't be there, I'll still do my countdowns and all that stuff. So that'll be coming probably around a month from now, three weeks from now, which means Jen won't be back, but then in November, she'll be back with two months' worth of questions and answers. So thanks for listening, everybody. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye. And now if you're still here, hold on. We'll get over to the personal cues and the personal A's. Okay, everybody, welcome back. It's time for the personal questions and answers. And, of course, there aren't quite as many of those as there were for the game. Hopefully, we'll get out of here in less than an hour, which is what we just did. I think about an hour and seven minutes. Um, we'll see how long we can talk about ourselves instead <laughs> of games. Starting with Kate, who... Um, so this is something that she's been wondering for months. Honey months? Guy. For months, oh Kate gosh. has been wondering. But she's hesitated to ask. Such a terribly loaded and triggering question. Oh um, so if it's just too painful, please accept her sincere apology and delete the question immediately. Clearly, I didn't delete it. Uh, for the record, all I do is when something comes into questions at rado.com, I just look at it briefly to see if it's a game-related question <clears throat> or if it's a personal-related question or if it's both, so I know what directory to put it in. And then I forget about it. And so I, I, apparently I didn't delete it, but so here it comes, honey pie. Are you prepared? <laughs> this has been vetted thoroughly. Uh, she's always wondered um, if you guys made the choice not to have kids or if the universe chose for you. Oh, we definitely made the choice. Yes. Um, she's had two miscarriages. I'm very sorry, <coughs> Kate. Oh, yeah. Um, know how sensitive the subject can be. I wanted to extend my sympathy if it was out of your hands. And all right. So, uh, it's a super personal, and no way need to tell, Pff, personal? What's super personal? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, after we've everything we've talked about, this is no big deal. Yeah, it's it's actually something I've known 
since I was a little kid myself that I did not want to have kids. I always knew that, hey, if I ever get married, uh, it's, it, it, there won't be any kids. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure we made that clear before we got married, right? We did not make it clear. I totally made it clear. You totally didn't. Mm. No, I think I made it clear, but you thought, you know, he'll come around. Hmm. He'll grow out of it. I'll convince him or something like that. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Well, anyway, he brought me around to his way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, because I always figured, yeah, of course I'm going to have kids. That's just, you know, what you think as a... I, I think as a, a woman or a girl growing up, yeah, you're, yeah, I mean, just part of being a woman. But um, we decided fairly early on in our marriage, you know, probably within the first year of being married, that actually that was okay, that we didn't need to have kids. And um, so we kind of, yeah, we agreed on that. And I always thought, well, you know, at worst, um, we can make a different decision later. But turns out, it was a good decision. I'm very happy with it. And yeah, just can't can't imagine how our lives would have been different otherwise, but I'm very happy with how they turned out. Yeah, I mean the reality is, I mean I've always known I wouldn't want to, but you know, like Jen said, if if it turned out, I mean apparently mm -hmm. vasectomies are reversibles. I'm not really sure if they are or not. They warned me, don't do it. They're not reversible, but I think they're just saying that cuz I was so young. But the reality is, I always thought, well, geez, if somehow I do have such a life-altering, changing event that I change my mind on this, we can always adopt. Yep. Because, you know, there's so many kids out there who need that. So, yeah. It, it, for us, it was a no-brainer, totally in our control, other than the ridiculous circumstances under which the vasectomy <laughs> happened. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Mario is back. Oh. And I and, and I said Dobby... Daisy is outside barking. Mm -hmm. Has she stopped? Yes. Yay! Okay. Back to Mario. Honey Pie. <clears throat> it's a Star Wars versus Star Trek kind of question. Oh, dear. So he's talking with some friends. Uh, one told them in the USA, people were either on Team Star Wars or Team Star Trek. Now, he's never dug either, Mario, but is always curious. Can you confirm this? Do people say live long and prosper to a Yoda figure and everyone starts to scream for blood? Uh... Yeah, I, oh yeah, I mean, there's certainly a Star Wars versus Star Trek rivalry in the the worlds of geekdom, and I'm certainly not at all unusual for people to stake a claim and define their identity by how they feel about those two hallowed science fiction franchises. Yeah, I would say that's certainly a thing. I'm surprised to say it's only in America, though. I'm sure it's pretty much a thing everywhere. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where you're from, Mario. I'm going to assume Italia, and that might be uh, presumptuous of me, but I'd be willing to bet there's plenty of hot-blooded Italians who are very strongly opinionated about Star Wars versus Star Trek as well. All the thing about it, I guess probably there are fewer. It is, it is probably more of an American thing, right? Probably. Or maybe more of an English-speaking thing? I mean, I know there's mm. plenty of Brits who are all about Star Trek versus Doctor Who, oh. and they'll, they'll battle to the death over that, <laughs> that hill. Oh. But, yeah. So, oh, by the way, Star Wars or Star Trek? Me? Yeah. Star Trek. Yeah? Definitely. To the death! Uh, I like a utopian future. Mm-hmm. Where everybody gets along and has a job and is not worried about money and everybody's taken care of. Yep. Uh, for Working me, together. I, I like Star Wars just fine. Loved Last Jedi. And I absolutely loved it. Probably my... Maybe my favorite Star Wars film, or certainly second or third favorite. And but yeah, Star Trek all the way. And what I always like, you know, Star Trek is, you know, uh, Star Wars is good, you know, mythic storytelling. But Star Trek is actually about something. Star Trek is about the human condition. And you know, I mean, Star Wars may have changed the movie making industry, but Star Trek changed the world. Literally changed the world by um, you know inspiring generations of you know engineers and and astronomers and uh, you know so much of the technology that was introduced to the zeitgeist through star trek you know, ultimately I mean, the inventor of the cell phone is on record saying he took his inspiration from star trek in that invention i mean star wars can't compete yeah it's it's nice to have space wizards and all that but yeah it's it it, it can't compete star trek for life <laughs> Let's see. Another topic. My girlfriend and I are going to spend some time in Malta at the end of August. Two days in Malta and two in Gozo. <laughs> oh, Mario, uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, we he would like to know, that. what are the things we cannot miss? 
And um, anything we should do. Honestly, if I'd seen this in time, Mario, I'm sorry. I, I would have just said, we can't tell you anything that you wouldn't know from TripAdvisor or something like that. I mean, oh, somebody's at the door. I'll get them. Okay. You can tell. Um, um, you know, one of my favorite things to do anywhere I go is just basically wander around and see what you see. Uh, that's one of the reasons I really like geocaching, too, because oftentimes if you go to geocaching.com, um, you'll find um, highly recommended caches, and they will take you places that no guidebook ever would have taken you. And I like seeing real stuff. I like, you know, kind of seeing the behind the scenes, things that are just not, you know, put in tourist brochures. So that is what I would recommend. Good answer. I cannot improve <clears throat> on that. So... Have a nice day, Mario. Christian is also having a really personal question, honey. Oh, dear. Um, have either of us ever gone to a therapist or a psychologist? And if so, did it help? Oh. Uh, Christian has had surgery and is having a hard time getting out of bed. which had an impact on the overall mood. Went to see someone about it yesterday, and it was tough. It's the first time talking to someone like that and wondered if either of you have had any thoughts or feedback on something like this. <laughs> well, Christian, honestly, I, I, my instinctual response to that the first thing that pops in my head is well, no neither of us have and i don't think we need to because we have each other uh you know we we are each other's therapist mm. you know we do talk through our problems and you know i i can't speak for other relationships other couples but i would say we are probably much more open and honest with each other than is maybe the norm and it's, it's certainly one of the uh, bedrock foundations of our marriage and so yeah we haven't needed to but yeah, I'm certainly supportive. I don't think there should be any shame or stigma. No, gosh, no. Because everybody, I mean, we're a social species. It's 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 what it's it's the key to our success is you know our, our ability to interact with each other. And you know if if you know mental health is just as important as physical health at the end of the day, if not more so, if, because yeah, a lot of physical problems are actually in your head. Yeah, you or know? yeah, yeah, yeah. They they come out of your <clears throat> mental state. So yes, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Are caused by your mental state mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we have never we have never needed to. Have you ever felt like you needed to? Um, I think I've had sort of a passing interest in various types of psychoanalysis stuff. Just in that, oh, does somebody you know could somebody talk to me and give me the key to <clears throat> whatever's bugging me at the moment, basically, or you know whatever. Like someone with more ex life experience could just sh give me some shortcuts. And I always appreciate reading a book where the author has done the research and, and can summarize stuff in such a way that he's just saved me, I don't know, three or four years of his studying mm -hmm. by writing this book and letting me read it in a week or two. Daisy. We've let Daisy in to stop from barking, and now she's scratching at the... Yeah, she's arranging the grass. To get ready for a hunker down. Yep. Got to get that grass flat. Um, anyway, so I, I think I think there's a fascination with that and just that you kind of hope somebody has a magic wand and could just fix something um, with their knowledge and or experience. And so that is what kind of interests me in that. But I think... Um, well, back in the day, you actually used to read a lot of, um, you know... Self-help books. Yeah, self-improvement books. Yeah. So I think it probably grew out of that as well. And... Um, yeah, but I think Duck's right. I mean, oftentimes we our friends are our therapists as well because we're just, you know, getting something. Oftentimes, just talk, just saying something either clarifies it for yourself when you hear it actually come out of your mouth or somebody who loves you can give you some really good feedback on that. Or, you know, hey, there's nothing wrong with talking about it to a professional who has training and experience and can, you know, hopefully help you get through whatever it is faster because there's no point in wallowing and yeah. anything. We only got this life, as far as, far as I know. Um, so, yeah, make it as good as possible. I agree. You're two for two, honey pie. Ooh. Let's move on to Henrik. Oh, oh wait. Oh, that's the last that's thing. The, yeah, we'll come back to Henrik at the end, yeah. as per usual. Uh, so, Jen wonders, can we give a rundown of all the pets, dogs, that we have had together? Aww. And uh, Jen has included a photo of her pup. Oh! See. Who loves watching Rado as much as she does? There's the pup <laughs> watching me. Yeah, you look like you've got a scary expression on your face. You're <laughs> like very I'm intent. scolding the dog. Yeah, and oh, uh, is that a that's a golden retriever, but mixed with something, right? Yeah, I'm not sure what. Maybe um, I don't know. Got the dark ears. Kind of yeah. makes me feel a little bit 
Um, oh, but but really, no one can me. see this. So <laughs> anyway. Well, what a cute little dog! It's a fuzzy dog. All right, Honey Pie. Let's run down our pet history. Okay. Well, let's see. I, together or all of them? She said together. All right. Well, uh, well, actually, when we got married, you weren't particularly into dogs. I think you've I think... Se since said. I mean, I've had dogs all my life growing up. Yeah. I, I've had my first dog when I was five, and we, you know, that was, that was lucky. We turned out not to be very lucky. And then we had Wiggles and Boatnik and Harley and uh, and then and uh, and the cats too. We had Sesame and Shazam. 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 And I, I, I was a kid. What, hey, what was I gonna, first thing I'm gonna name my cat Shazam because I loved Shazam when I was a little kid. Um, Daisy loves it when you say that word. Oh, really? She's looking a little wild-eyed at the moment, really. Do you think because I said the word Shazam? No. Know. No, that I was guess weird. not. Okay. Anyway, so, but anyway, we got married, and I never heard you say anything about dogs, really. And how, how did we come by Scuttle? What happened there? Oh, I think I was just waiting to get our own house. Yeah, but why? Because... I think you've told me you were not that into dogs or something. So, no. I mean, and you were the one who totally initiated getting a dog. I know. So what was the... Okay, well, first of all, um, we had a border collie, the really fuzzy kind, um, growing up. And her name was Missy. And she was one we actually inherited from sort of the neighborhood. <clears throat> she had puppies and nobody was really caring for her. So we just kind of took her on. And man, she lived a long time. She died after I moved out for college. Yeah. I mean, she was a, what a great dog though. Oh, so good. Um, so yeah, so she was kind of the dog we had in our, in our childhood. Although, um, when my parents got divorced, um, we did have a couple of dogs when we were just living with mom, but for some reason they did not seem to last. And I, I, I have to confess that I don't really know what happened to them. Um, I know that we would go off like on a holiday, summer holiday, and my mom's boyfriend was supposed to watch them. And when we came back, they had run away. I don't know if that mm. means he took them to the pound or, mm. or what. I don't know. And I, you know, I guess I just wasn't as committed a dog owner at that point in my life when I was eleven or twelve. Um, but I can remember those dogs um, All right. that we had as well. So, yeah, so and you we did always like dogs. had cats. But you weren't crazy for dogs. I think I've become more crazy for I know. dogs since I've gotten older. Okay. Right, but anyway, so together, we got Scuttle. Right, so we got married, and within, I'm going to say, and we bought a house within a year of getting married, and then within a couple of months of moving into the house, we you were just, found... Um, you were looking in classifieds, because yeah, this was back, back before in the, the internet, when you looked for dogs, <laughs> or looked for pets on classifieds, and free puppies, come get them! I think maybe we, we paid 30 bucks or something for Scuttle. Whoa! I know, I was... It was big monetary commitment at that point because mm -hmm. um, we were house poor we, yes we freshly married we didn't even go on a honeymoon or anything so <laughs> um but yeah so she it was just advertised as a you know small mixed breed dog and we got there and i think we were the first people to come oh really so, so we had the pick of the litter and i remember there being sort of five or six of these little squirmy dogs and they were adorable of course and somebody else arrived while we were there and they had to wait because <laughs> we got pick of the litter um wow. yeah Okay. Um, and I don't remember what it was about Scuttle that captured my heart, but something. It was something. Um, so we got her when she was, you know, sort of six, eight weeks old, that sort of thing. And she was a Lhasa Opso mix. Small dog, black, fuzzy, adorable. And she was wonderful. Um, we, at the time, I had this old red fleece robe that she took as, as her own, as part of her bedding and everything. And so we would just, we had that for years and years and years, and we would just drag her around with it. She'd latch onto it with her mouth and then just kind of put her, her feet out behind her, you know, like like a flying dog. And so she'd, she'd be clamped onto this thing and her legs would be out in the back. And she's really a furry dog. So we would just kind of, like we had hardwood floors. So we'd just kind of run around the house and be dragging her and she'd be having the time of her life and <laughs> kind of mopping. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't we didn't spray it down or anything at the time, but this was our dust mopping. Yeah, uh, but she was awesome. Yeah, she was a really good dog. So that was Scuttle, um, and uh, unfortunately, she ended up having Cushing's disease, which is an endocrine disorder. It's either in your pituitary gland or your um, uh, adrenal gland, and she had the kind that you could treat with pills. So uh, fortunately, so we were able to get a couple more years of of time with her by giving her medication. Um, and we, we had moved to Bend by that point. No, no. actually to Austin. Yeah. Right. So we'd moved to Austin and Austin had this place called puppy heaven. 
and it was a corner um, on two busy streets and lots and lots and lots and lots of people like probably would you say 40 or 50 people would come and they would have yeah. little play pens or little dog crates or what have you and they would have their puppies out there and they would put little signs out you know dosh hounds or los opsos or beagles or huskies or whatever they had and so on a weekend i think this was usually saturday saturdays it might uh, you know you austin people probably know what i'm talking about maybe it wasn't saturdays but anyway you could just go and they would be there every week and so we We'd gone a couple times and I'd petted the Lhasa Opsos and I thought, oh, look at how strong I am. I can, I can resist, pick these puppies up and love on them a bit and then put them back. And so, but one day we stopped in and there was Dob mm -hmm. and I was lost. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just instantly fell in love and I don't know, I don't know what it is. What, what is it about that makes your heart fall in love? I don't know, but. Well, in that case, it, because she was all alone in like a clothes hamper. She was the last one of the litter. Um, well, that wasn't a clothes hamper. It was like one of those play pins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So, and so there was some other puppies next to her, but she was, she was by herself. That is true. Mm -hmm. But she was so cute. Oh, my goodness. And so, yeah, she was, I think, $300? Something really? like that. Yeah, I mean, some crazy amount of money. Because she was an, uh, supposedly a purebred and all that. Beagle, yeah. yeah so, um, so I think we had a little bit of money on us. And so we put a deposit down while we went off to the bank and withdrew drew cash and everything. But I just remember thinking, what am I doing? This is crazy. I'm spending $300 on a dog. That's just, just, just craziness. But I couldn't help myself. Yep. Yep. The heart that was wants, back when we were making a lot of money. What the heart wants. Yep. So the heart got what it wanted. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh my gosh, she was so cute. So we brought her home and Scuttle's like, what the heck have you done? What is, what, what is this? Like I didn't have enough problems. Yeah, yeah I've got Cushing's disease. Did you know? Um, but, oh, Dobby just, you know how puppies are. And they just kind of bulldoze their way into your life. And, uh, it's just wonderful. And so, yeah, so actually Scuttle trained Dobby how to fetch balls and she, how she just loved these um, Kongs that have funny knobs on them so they bounce in unpredictable ways. Um, and, and also taught, because as a Lhasa Opso, Scuttle, her breed just is a uh, traditionally a palace guard dog. And so their primary job is to be near their owners and to protect them. So that's what Scuttle was, is she always just wanted to be with us. And beagles tend to be a bit more independent and follow their noses. But because Dobby was raised by Scuttle, Dobby always stuck really close. And we never had a problem with her being off leash or running away or getting out or digging or, you know, any of those traditional beagle behaviors. And I thoroughly credit Scuttle for that. Um, so they got to live together for about three years. And uh, about that time, we found out that the pet passport thing was going on in England, which means that you didn't have to put your dog in quarantine for six months if you wanted to move to England and we wanted to try something new. So um, we promptly started the process, which basically meant we had to get the dogs um, rabies shots. And then six months later, they have to have a test to make sure they're rabies free. And once they've done that, they can get their pet passport and basically come into England straight away. And of course they have a, a microchip so you can positively identify the dog. But I mean, that was really the major stumbling block. So we're like, Oh, that's really cool. So, maybe we should start thinking about making an international move now that we know that we don't have to put our dogs in quarantine. So that was really interesting. And we, we went on a trip. We decided to take a trip to England and Denmark and duck interviewed with a bunch of companies and uh, got a couple of job offers. So that made it, you know, viable for us to actually move over there because you have to kind of have an employer sponsor you to come over. You have to have a, a skill that is not readily available in their country, which video game design is fairly specialized. So um, that's actually what's allowed us to move pretty much anywhere we wanted to live in the world. So yay, yay. video game design. <clears throat> so um, unfortunately, during this time, Scuttle was just getting worse and worse and worse. And so it, it, it became pretty obvious to us that it was time to uh, Say to, goodbye. To let her go, yeah. And so we did that. And unfortunately, it was all during the whole moving and all that stuff. So it was just, ugh. Ah, oh, I know. I hate the all that. Was, uh, yeah, we, we, that job trip, she had died, I think, a week before that job trip. Something like that, maybe two weeks. And I remember, I still oh, yeah. very clearly remember all these 
flying around and driving around we were doing and we were we had a layover in <laughs> an airport in Denmark or no Amsterdam and we were just waiting for a flight and at one point I don't remember what specifically prompted but we just both started crying just just yeah. so hard just in the middle of the airport because we were thinking about scuttle because we hadn't for a week because we'd had this whirlwind trip and all that and then it just came back because we were on our way back home yeah Oh, God. So, anyway. Um, so, you can just focus on the good parts. You don't have to, <laughs> like, do their whole biography, I don't think. Oh, well, okay. You can take over if you No, can. no, no. Go ahead. It's just... I don't want to have to go through this with Tula dying and Dobby dying, too. Oh, God. Um, okay. So, so we ended up moving with just Dobby and got to England, no problem and all that. And had, you know, several years very happily with just Dob. And she seemed to be doing okay as an only dog. Um, but there's a thing called Beagle Welfare in England, and it's basically a, a special Beagle charity that is devoted to rehoming Beagles specifically. So um, I got kind of on their mailing list and decided that, yeah, probably we needed to get another dog, uh, another Beagle. And when we talked to the organizers of the charity, they said, oh, actually, there's a, um, a Beagle breeder near you who retires their breeding stock. And um, they've just let us know that they have a dog that actually sounds like she'd be a really good fit for you. Um, and they're only, you know, what, 90 minutes away or something like that. So why don't you get in touch with them and drive down and go meet them and whatever. So we're like, oh, that sounds really interesting because, you know, we didn't know anything. So we drove down <clears throat> and we met them and they are actually breeders of Crufts um, level dogs. So uh, they had, huh, I, I'll never forget, we drove up and parked the car. We had Dob in the car because, of course, we were going to have Dobby meet whoever this new dog was. Um, and so we were getting out and they opened their front door and this cavalcade of beagles erupts out of their door. It's like a waterfall of beagles just yeah. flowing out their door. I think there must have been at least a dozen yep. beagles that they had. I would have thought more like. 15 or 20. Uh, definitely not 20, but maybe okay. 15. But anyway, oh, it was just amazing. I'm thinking, oh, this is in my future. I've definitely got to have me some <laughs> of that. <clears throat> so um, it was wonderful. Um, so yeah, we, we, we met um, Tallulah, who had been named by their daughter. And she had been indeed a breeding bitch, which they say that with a straight face in England. <laughs> And they just had decided to retire her. She was five years old. And I think they showed me some pictures of her litters. I think she'd only had two puppies, maybe three puppies in, in two different litters. So, it, you know, obviously she wasn't a very prolific breeder. And that was probably why they decided to retire her. But, oh, my God, what a goofball. She was just so full of energy and goofiness and fun. And, uh, you know, by this point, Dobby, I think, was eight or nine and so a little bit older and, and Tula was five, but Dobby had also had some health problems. And so she, we were switching her diet around and getting her some, um, oh, things for achy joints and things like that. So it turns out that a change of diet did help her a lot. And we were also feeding her resveratrol, which is a um, drug that's supposed to help kind of regenerate youthfulness. Not a drug. What would you call it? It's an extract. An extract. It's from grapes, kind of like this. The good stuff in red wine. So yeah. So actually, Dobby perked up a lot once we got Tula, and they had a, a lovely six years together. I think, and really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, um, Tula ended up getting cancer, and so God, this was another oh, stupid thing we had to do with. Um, unexpected, of course. I thought she eaten a piece of plastic, which was why she was throwing up all the time, um, that had gotten lodged in her, her innards. And they went in to look and see if they could find this piece of plastic and just found cancer everywhere. So we had an awful, awful thing of basically having to decide right then and there. No warning at all. Yeah, coincidentally, while we were recording a podcast. <laughs> that was really awful. Um, but we just, you know... We, we, we had to do what was best for her. So, uh, anyway, that was that. Uh, and um, Dobby got to stay with us for another, I think, not quite a year. But she was getting on. She was almost 16. Uh, and unfortunately, I was in over here visiting family. And it became obvious it was time for Dob. So Duck had to do that on his own. That was truly awful because, you know, I would want I wanted to be there, but 
Yeah. You can only do what you can do. And, um, oh, but in the meantime, so Tula had passed on and we had gotten, so we, we got back in touch with, um, the people that bred Tula and said, you know, she had cancer. Just want to let you know in case anybody needs to know further down the line or whatever. And, um, by the way, I don't suppose you've got any cousins or sisters or relatives of Tula with that same goofy character that, you know, need rehoming, do you? And they said, this is very strange, but we just got a, a lovely young girl back um, who, uh, through no fault of her own, has been returned to us. And yeah, she's a lot like Tula. <laughs> and we're like, oh, that's great. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. 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 So that actually did help a lot to look forward to meeting Gertrude. Um, which I did at my earliest possibility, which was a couple months because um, we were traveling with my parents to Africa that summer. So we did that. Oh, that was an amazing trip. Um, anyway, met Gertrude. And yeah, oh, of course, she definitely was the one for us. So I brought her back to Malta. And so Dob was still there. So she got to meet Gert. And um, we all lived happily for a while. And actually, we decided to adopt Daisy as well because we thought it would be nice to have two dogs of the same age because it was quite clear that a two-year-old beagle and a 15 or 16-year-old beagle um, didn't have the same interests. Yeah. <laughs> so we looked online. They did get along well, though, I thought. Oh, yeah, they loved yeah, yeah. each other and slept and where they were great buddies and stuff, but the energy levels just were not compatible. Yeah. So um, they, I'd been kind of keeping an eye. And in Malta, everything is done on Facebook. Everything. I mean, you don't have a yellow page ad. You have a Facebook page yeah. and stuff. But there was a group, um, and I, I didn't understand it for the longest time because it's just a foreign concept to me. But basically, um, a lady in Sicily um, publicizes the dogs only on Facebook. And so she listed dogs that she had available on a monthly basis. And then, you know, as they would get rehomed, they would obviously come off her Facebook page. Anyway, I finally figured out how this thing worked and got in touch with her. And I said, these are, you know, the dogs I have currently, and this is the kind of dog we're looking for. And do you have any? And she said, I do actually. And, um, so we kind of did some Skype conversations and she showed us Daisy whose name was Crunchy at the time mm -hmm. um, because apparently there's a candy bar in England called Crunchy that is just so delicious that it's just the best thing in the world so that's why she called um, this little dog Crunchy but um, she had found her on the street uh, pregnant and um, had had her for a couple months while Daisy gave birth to some fairly large dogs actually and uh, but and but the puppies were now weaned and daisy was healed from the birthing uh which was very difficult apparently because anyway um so she was ready to to rehome them and she was actually rehoming the two her two puppies daisy's two puppies on malta as well so it was all going to be a big family thing over here and it looked great and everything and uh so that was wonderful so we went and met them and yeah took dobby and gert and met daisy and all was well and so there you go. That's our dogs. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, and then so, so, so yeah, so we had three dogs for a while, and then Dob passed on, and then now we have the two. Good gracious, was that more information than ever you wanted to Jeez, know? Jeez, you want to get Jen talking? Ask her a dog question. Because <laughs> apparently I'm dog crazy. She is dog crazy. All right. Well, that was a rundown. Was that? Everything? That was the question. Rundown on the pets, dogs you and Jen have had together. Okay. I mean, there were a couple others you missed for a week. Oh. Well, those were just dogs we were fostering. Yeah. And caring for while they found... Yeah. Yeah. They were abandoned or whatever. Okay. Charlie <laughs> wonders, what's our stance on travel insurance? Ever bought it? Used it? We've traveled so extensively, he's curious about our approach. Mm. We have had travel insurance, um, mainly once we moved to Malta, because as... As British citizens living in England, there's something called the EHIC, and God no, I have no idea what will happen now but with Brexit and stuff. But it used to be that um, it, as a British citizen, if you were traveling, you could get medical coverage in uh, equal to the NHS, National Health Service, anywhere you were in Europe. And so you just had an EHIC card, and it, it, you took it with you when you traveled, and we never had to use it or anything, but it was very comforting to know it was there. Malta and England have a reciprocal agreement. So when we moved to Malta, we got um, health coverage based on the fact that we're British. And so, you know, it was a reciprocal thing. Um, but our EHIC cards became null and void. So at that point, yes, we were interested in travel insurance because we wouldn't be covered um, because we're living in Malta. 
but we were coming from the British thing, but I don't know, it was just too complicated to try and have an EHIC card arrangement, I guess. So yeah, we have bought some before. Um, we've bought annual policies in Europe. It is so cheap. It's like 50 bucks to cover both of us for a year. So yeah, it was just silly not to have it. Um, I think that answers the question. I think so. Yeah, and as far as U.S. coverage, when we were in in Europe and, and we traveled here, we had no coverage because uh, everybody over there knows that healthcare is crazy over here, and there was no way that they could possibly afford to cover U.S. travel. Yeah, or yeah, travel of European citizens in the U.S. So yeah. coming to the U.S. was the most dangerous place. Okay, Thomas says, "Hey, <laughs> what's your favorite DC movie?" Would that be... Do you even know what that means? I think DC Comics, right? That's right. I'm going to go with that one that I thought was hilarious. With um, Thor. That's a Marvel. Oh. That so, Thor Ragnarok. What's... Superman movies, Batman movies, the Wonder Woman movie. I like the Wonder Woman movie. That was nice. Did you? You didn't seem to be that impressed by it at the time. You didn't really go gaga for it. Yeah. All right. What else? That's it? Uh, well, I, have to choose between I think that you have seen, yes. I think you've only. No, we did see Green Lantern, but I doubt either of us remember it. Um, I'm sure. And you haven't seen the. You've only. You, you haven't seen Batman vs Superman, or you haven't seen Justice League. So, really, what's your favorite Batman or Superman movie? I think is what the question is for you. The one where he's in California and the earthquake happens. Okay, there you go. That's a long time ago, but that's the one I remember. Yeah, all right. Well, I mean, the obvious answer, I think, is Dark Knight. And I really do love Dark Knight. I absolutely adore it. It is kind of long, though. Um, but you know what? I'm, I'm going to go buck the trend and say I really like Batman vs. Superman. I thought it was actually pretty good. I think you went off and saw that on your own in Malta, didn't you? Yes, I did. And, um, and I actually liked Man of Steel, except... That, uh, you know, they, they just need to exercise some restraint. They just need to shave 15 minutes of wanton destruction porn out of that, and it would have been fantastic. Uh, but I like the uh, grimmer, darker take of, you know, kind of a more what, almost Watchmen-esque version of the DC EU. Uh, so, actually, I really liked him. But, yeah, I, I guess you'd have to go with Dark Knight. Um, hey, Honey Pie. Yeah. Have you seen the last Avengers movie? And if so, what did you think? I have no idea. No, you haven't. Okay. I have. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> I think it's absolutely... Uh, it's it's an incredible cinematic achievement, and it has lived up to the 10-year pedigree that led up to it. Absolutely phenomenal. Honey, what is the best car you've ever driven? The best car I've ever driven? Yep, he's asking because of the new Prius. Wow. I liked my Suzuki. Huh. I had a Suzuki Grand Vitara for a dozen years. Bought it new, gave it up when we were in England, actually. Yeah, shipped it over there. I really like that car. It, it, it carried everything I might, ever might want to carry in it. It was comfortable. I'm going to say the Prius. I don't know how you could say otherwise. The Prius is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I, I did love the Bongo, too. The Bongo was absolutely phenomenal yeah, as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. Can you share some of the events and stories you went through in the last few weeks? Do you have any tips for people who have to move? Now, of course, they wrote that back in August 22nd. Uh, do we have any advice other than don't move three times in a row? That would be good advice. Yeah, how about... Uh, uh, yeah, um, I mean, the biggest problems we've had have been with the fact that 10 items just didn't show up from our international move. And we'll never see that stuff now. It's just totally gone. And we are trying to get the insurance company to acknowledge that. And that is proving to be very painful and arduous and difficult. They are digging in their heels every way they can. Yep. Well, and they took six months to get something, get our stuff here. It should have taken two months, maybe three. Mm -hmm. So that has had a whole knock on effect of a lot of extra stress that we just really didn't need. Yeah. Um, stuff is, you know, the, oh my gosh, it's, it's, you should see the state of the boxes when they arrived here too. They'd just been crushed in, bashed, collapsed, repackaged, restuck on a new crate. It just, yeah. So yeah, stuff got broken. Stuff isn't working. It, I just feel like we paid for a service that 
we, we had actually thought maybe we would just send all our boxes individually through the post office. And we did. We did send and we started like doing six that. or seven of them. And then I thought, oh my God, I need somebody to take custody of my stuff. I need somebody to love it and usher it <laughs> from here to the States and bring it very gently into my house. And that is not what happened. Yep. And meanwhile, the six things we sent through the post office showed up with no real problems at all. Yep. Yeah, we were concerned, oh, customs duties or, you know, or things getting lost or things getting bashed or whatever. But actually, our stuff got far more abused in, I guess there was five carriers who dealt with our packages yep. from between Malta and here. Yeah. Yeah, just really not impressed. Yeah. We got boned. <sighs> so, yeah, that's unfortunate. That's kind of taken up a... And the thing was, we'd had excellent moves before that. I mean, we had, uh, well... Of course, they were paid for by your employer. Um, moving yeah. from Austin to England, everything went smooth as clockwork. Um, moving from England to Malta, again, I mean, guys just showed up, took my stuff away, and it showed up three weeks later just fine in Malta. We moved ourselves from Malta over to Gozo. With um, My dad and Nance helped me, yeah. helped with that. That was amazing. But yeah, this, this move back here, I don't know if it was because we started sort of, I don't want to call it a third world country, but... In a, kind of a third world country. <laughs> well, yeah, we just, I think we just get what we pay for. And well, we went, we went on the cheap. We did try to save a little bit of money, but it wasn't that much less expensive than the other guy. I think we, we went with a local guy rather than a big international moving company, mm -hmm. which we definitely went in the big international moving company when we moved from Austin to England. Yeah. So when we move back to England, we will be going with a big international moving company that knows yeah. what they're doing, not Joe Blow down the street. Yeah. <clears throat> or maybe I'll just get rid of everything. There you go. And Because we've got plenty of stuff left in England. <laughs> I've got a whole studio still set up there. Yep. Um, right. So the advice would be don't move. Stay <laughs> where you are. Make it work. Fair enough. Let's see here. Um, yeah. Any other tips for moving? No, not really. No. I wouldn't say we wouldn't say we're particularly good at it. No, we're definitely not good at it. No. Um, although I have to say, for the amount of abuse our boxes took, surprisingly few things broke. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I must be okay. Yep. And we uh, yeah. We put a lot of stuff in plastic boxes inside of the boxes, though. All the my really important stuff. Mm -hmm. So it had an extra layer of cush. Yep. So maybe that. Oh, hey, here's something. We had um, so what do you call them? Memory foam mattress covers. Uh -huh. Just, you know, it's a layer of foam. And we had two of them in Malta because we had one for our guest bedroom and one for our bedroom. And we thought, well, you know, we were only going to have one bed when we get because, you know, his mom sleeps on a twin. So we actually cut up that foam memory thingy and used that as padding around our mostest, mostest importantest stuff. So I would say that is pretty darn good insulation. Well, I would hope so. Those are pretty expensive, those well, okay. toppers. Yeah, but we'd also used them for six years. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. they were... Yep. It was nice to repurpose them. Good, good stuff. My main suggestion would be just keep reminding yourself they're just things. Mm -hmm. They're just things. They don't matter. None of it matters. There's just stuff. Yep. All righty. Uh, next up, we have Rachel, who wonders, have we seen Solo, a Star Wars story? Answer, no. If not, do you plan on renting it? Answer, yes. If so, what did you think? I haven't seen it yet. I very much want to. I've been dying to. But every day, I hope, is the day that we will hang up our, our uh, what do you call it, the, the screen for the projector. Because I don't want to watch it on the TV. I want to watch it big screen with the surround sound and all that. And Jen keeps saying, oh, we'll do it. And then we just never do it. So, no, we haven't seen it. But I am very excited to see it. And let's see here. As I love, mostly because I love Ron Howard. I mean, you cannot go wrong. Jen has foolishly left Daisy out of the room, and now she's gone outside and started barking and annoying the neighbors, which is proving to be a real problem. We really have to, it wasn't so much of an issue living in Malta in the middle of nowhere where there was nobody around, but there are people here. So we really need to get on the ball with keeping her under control. Let's see here. Rachel's next question is for Jen, and Jen has not returned. So I will wait for Jen to return on that and move on to... This is one for both me and Jen. If we could visit any... F oh, my goodness. All right. Yeah, I'm back. Jeepers creepers. Sorry. All righty. 
Uh, are you interested in one day visiting the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Studio? Yes, I would love to. Yes. We were in London for months and we didn't go to any of the stuff there. I know. Or not London, England. England, I know. It's just uh, time passes and pretty soon you've got to leave the country. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, we, do, we, just, we did the best we could. Yep. I think that'd be pretty cool. Not that she asked me. For both of us, <laughs> if you could visit any fictional land or world one day, what would you choose? Uh, what would you choose if you were to visit for six months? Um, what would you choose if you were to live there for 10 years? Oh, those are good questions. Um, hmm. It's so easy. There's a lot of fictional worlds out there. All right, go ahead. Well, you go ahead. I'll think. All right, I've, 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 but then it'll just be done because you won't have anything else to beat it. Yeah, are you saying um, Hogwarts and stuff? No. You, you just talked about it like an hour ago. The future of Star Trek. Oh, Earth. Earth. yeah. Circa star date, whatever um, the timeline the next generation is taking place in. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's pretty much it. Done. No money, no needs, no wants. Infinite, limitless possibility to do whatever you want, to be whatever you want, to achieve whatever you want. Okay, well, that would be there for 10 years. That would be my 10-year choice. Okay. Um, I think I would Why like Why would to... you not want to do it for six months? I'm... If you could go anyplace for six hours, why wouldn't you go there? How could you possibly pick any pick something better for well, any length of time? Yeah, well, I would like to I would like to go live in a wizarding world for six months. That'd be really cool. I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's I'm going to choose J.K. Rowling for mm -hmm. six months, and I'm going to choose Star Trek Next Gen for ten years. Okay. And for one day, I mean, I would really love to go to Hobbiton. That would be so cool. Mm-hmm. Um, of course. So, uh, yeah, that, that'll be my choice. At the moment, I mean, those are just so big and obvious. I, that's why I was saying if I had time to think about it, I might, I might choose somewhere else. Okay. How about you? Star Trek, Star Trek, and Star Trek. Okay. You're not going to go see, um, Star Wars something? That'd be a terrible place a to be. Oh my God, it's so awful there. It's grungy and dirty and... Everybody's fighting and shooting and warring all the time with the stars in the wars. <laughs> it's in the title. I'd rather go where they trek through the stars rather than war through the stars. That sounds good to me. Yep. Yeah. No brainer. All uh, right. So, and finally, finally, Henrik, who was asked three times. He sent the email on um, July 9th. And then another one on August 1st. And then finally on um, September 6th. Could Jen share her wisdom of the month? Oh, gosh. Um, there's so much, so many good ones. But I'm just going to, this is one I chose before we answered all these questions. So um, it's a Kurt Vonnegut quote. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. Okay. And it's, to practice any art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow. So do it. Okay. You heard it here first, folks. Just do it. Just do it do it all right um th that is it another month in the bag like i said before i'll be back sans gin in a few weeks to do an essen and then we will be back proper in november and try to catch up once again with the big q always running just to to stay afloat yeah well we're not going to essen this year so so um that should influence things a little bit as far as how quickly we get through things because we kind of get sort of a week and a half to two weeks of bonus time since we won't be traveling. Yeah, man, that means we'll finally get this house cleaned up. We Maybe have... we'll finally get the projector screen <laughs> hung and we'll finally see Solo. Uh, yes, we have many boxes still to unpack. Oh my God, it's such a mess. It is a Every, mess. You cannot look in any square inch of this house without seeing some pile of mess. Uh, square inch is possibly a little... Any square foot. Um, I'll say square meter. All right. Okay. We're in America. You mean square yard? Yes. All right. Okay, folks. Uh, thanks again for listening. I hope you have a very, very nice day. Yes. I also <laughs> wish that for you. <laughs> and talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye. So,